Amieta, Netawan Rudy Ortega, Nononi Tomiar, Pasevitam, Petavitam. Atawan, Mark V. Senor, Richard Ortega, Atawan. Hello everyone, my name is Rudy Ortega. I'm the tribal uh, president of the Fernandino and Tatavian Band of Mission Indians. I'm with my cousin Mark V. Senor and Richard Ortega, who are also on our tribal leadership. Uh, today we would like to acknowledge all the first peoples, my, our ancestors of the land of Fernandino and Tataviam from all the villages across Los Angeles, along with our cousins, the neighboring relatives of the Gabalino Tongva and the Chumash peoples. Being that it's spring, we'd like to welcome you all and bless with the song of a bear song. Hunwut is a bear in our language, under Serrano language, and we'd like to sing that song for you. Welcome everyone. It's an honor to be with you here today. Thank you, President Rudy Ortega of the Fernandino Tatavian Band of Mission Indians. Thank you to our indigenous friends and colleagues and partners for their deep ecological knowledge about the plants uh, and, and landscapes that we'll be talking about this weekend. I'm so excited to be here uh, again today. We had a wonderful night last night. I'm Evan Meyer, Executive Director at Theodore Payne Foundation. We are here to celebrate native plants and how important they are, how beautiful they are, how fun they are, how interesting they are. We're going to learn a lot. We're getting started. Erin, we had a great night last night. It was a really amazing night. We are we were so honored to have this incredible group of panelists last night. Thank you all so much um, for for coming out and and inspiring us. It's it was a great way to kick off uh, the evening, um, as well as our friends over at Eagle Rock Brewery. Uh, we are just in love with that local source beer. I heard it's selling fast. <laughs> so if you wanna get over there today um, and pick up some, uh, it's, it's delicious and I can be very you know, uh, picky about beer. So anyway, uh, and then finally, we had just an amazing uh, musical uh, and visual experience um, with uh, Daniel and Paul of uh, Tito Tunes. And um, if you missed any of that last night, it's going to all be available. Um, we're sending going to be sending you all a link so that you can see it at, again uh, on YouTube and and every day too. So you'll on Monday, you'll be getting a link. You can rewatch any of this at your own pace uh, at your own uh, on your own time. So um, and it, let's see what else. There's so many things I want to tell you guys today, but we also just want to get into the gardens. Today is going to be all about experiencing these gardens. Um, and as you're following along today, uh, please jump into the chat. We had a really vibrant chat conversation last night, um, and we want to see what you're seeing out in the city. Um, see what's hear about the plants that you're you're seeing and experiencing. So jump into the chat uh, and. With that, I'm going to turn it back over to Evan. Thanks, Aaron. That's Aaron Johnson. Our outreach manager has done a lot of heavy lifting for this garden tour. This has been a, a pretty labor intensive process. We're so proud of, of the team. Um, we've got a bunch of them on right now. Marie Gonzalez, Marie Astrid Gonzalez, who is the visual mastermind behind all the beautiful footage you're going to see today. Really inspiring. We're going to get to see things in detail up close. Um, get the botanist's eye view of these gardens and these plants. Thank you, Marie, for that. We have Andrew and Scott, who are our tech team, making sure that everything goes smoothly. Cross your fingers, everyone. Uh, this is a live, live event, but we'll do our best. We have Katie Tilford monitoring the chat, and we have chats on U YouTube and Zoom. And we 
ask you to use them, not just to ask questions, but to share your own experiences, tell your ideas. Last night during our panel discussion, it was so amazing to, to just hear perspectives and the ideas flowing and interchange. And that is such an important process. And it really kind of crystallizes a vision that we can move forward with. So it was very exciting. Our panel discussion today is gonna to be wonderful starting around 11 a.m. But as we mentioned, today is all about gardens. So let's get into the gardens. I do wanna start um, briefly by just thanking our sponsors, particularly our Oak level sponsors, the Gottlieb Native Garden and LA Native Plant Source Garden for their very generous support of this. Many other generous sponsorships, all of them can be viewed on our website, nativeplantgardentour.org. That's gonna, uh, give you links to all of these wonderful sponsors and the things they do. Um, it also has a lot of additional content outside of this live stream. So we have interviews with all of the um, people behind the gardens, the eight feature gardens. We have 360 uh, imagery of all of the gardens in winter and spring, because our theme this year is the changing of the seasons. And we will see, um, we will see the seasons as they, as they change today as well. I wanna thank our members and our donors for making this possible. It would not be possible without you. I wanna thank our customers, people who bought tickets, so all of you. Um, this support is essential to keeping Theodore Payne vibrant and strong, and we very, very much appreciate that support. Our board of directors has set up an incredibly generous matching grant challenge where uh, up to $50,000 will be matched. So if you can spare any money for a tax deductible donation, and make a donation to Theodore Payne Foundation, that will be doubled until May 1st. So we really appreciate that. And thank you to, to our board for, for that support. It's really incredible. With that, we have a lot of gardens to cover today. So Aaron, I'm gonna pass it off to you. We're gonna start with a bang. This is a, a, re, a fantastic garden. Um, I'm gonna queue up the video. And where are we going first, Aaron? All right, so we are headed to Oxford Square, which is in the mid city area of Los Angeles. And we are spotlighting now Chris Elwell and Corey O'Dell, who have been working on this garden for many, many, many years. <laughs> hey, guys. Hey, Hello. how are you? We're great. How are you? Fine. I was looking for some of that native beer for get started for breakfast <laughs> a little it's early a perfect but you breakfast know what? drink yeah don't judge that. us we have our <laughs> methods <laughs> so we're going to start with a little promo clip with some of the music from the musician we heard last night and this is going to kind of just get us in the mood and in the in the vibe and then we're going to have a conversation with chris and Corey about their garden so we've got about a 30 second intro and then we'll let the conversations begin and you all in the chat are part of this conversation so please uh chat in guys so we're starting with a winter landscape um what do you how do you feel about winter in, in your garden what, what do you think of think of winter you know winter um winter is an interesting time because it sort of it segues into spring pretty quickly in this uh area we start getting spring vibes start cracking around the middle of january but it gets doesn't really get going till mid late March. So winter is a nice time. You know, the, the, the rain is starting to hit. You're starting to see bits of green. Um, and uh, as you can see from these pictures, we do start getting pokes of color. It's, it's the end of our dormancy period. Yeah, things wake up early. This was shot in January, right, Aaron? Yeah, this was shot in January. And um, you guys have been one of the stars of the garden tour for many, many years. And I have to say it's one of the gardens that inspired, really inspired me when I was first getting into this. And, um, but you've also done some new work just this year. 
Yeah, what you just panned across was um, an area that we kind of scraped. It was one of the first parts of the garden. It was the front. It was one of the first parts of the garden we worked on and, you know, made some rookie mistakes, overplanted. Some of the landscape features were not prominent enough to withstand the plants at their full size. So we just kind of nuked it. And uh, what you see here is Corey and, and um, our buddy Luis um, digging a pond, putting another water feature in the front. And moving large boulders. So it started as a small project and it kind of grew as they all do. <laughs> <laughs> it's so cool. It's such a, a neat feature. And that, that uh, re reclaimed theme of your garden, the Casa Apocalyptic theme, can you briefly just describe what that, what that is? That's the fancy way to say it. We also call it trash. <laughs> and it's, uh, yeah, it's really all about, um, I, the, the inspiration for our garden has always been really about kind of climate change and, um, and, you know, kind of where we're heading with our planet, our environment, and, and this garden was meant to imagine what happens if the people are gone and the and the native ecology comes back. So our property had a lot of uh, old equipment on it, a lot of, as we renovated this old house, uh, concrete chunks and bits of car parts and stuff, and we just chose to incorporate them into the landscape. Yeah, we found a lot of treasures here. Upcycling, that, that's the very fancy way. Yeah, and, and this, all these valves you see in the front, those were demoed out of a job Corey worked on, but um, that's meant to suggest kind of vaguely old water infrastructure, old oil infrastructure, both of those things obviously really important around here. In fact, on this, these very areas where we live, we're old oil derricks and stuff, so. Look at that hummingbird sage in, in HD is so gorgeous. I love that kind of resinous sticky flower that you yeah. get. You really see that sagey structure on those flowers because they're so big. This area too is interesting because there, there used to be a wall alongside the driveway there where you're seeing that. So those were all meant to be shade plants. But in this area, I guess we're coastal enough that the shade plants all like sun. So that fuchsia and the summingbird sage all does really well in full sun here. Yeah, and so we are seeing a lot of the winter flowers that typical on a typical garden tour we might miss because it's we're, we're waiting for the big burst of spring color. but. You have the ribes, the, the fuchsia flowered current. Um, you have manzanitas. That big in unit of a manzanita you just passed is our biggest, best one. And of course, it's one we planted by the trash cans. Like we had no <laughs> idea it was going to get that big. It looks looks nice if you happen to be by the trash cans. This feature is so cool. This um, native maidenhair fern. Yeah, they're, th those ferns are very happy there. I, I, we actually have to uh, take them back uh, you know, once every year or so. Um, just because they they privilegeate so much in the water, uh, they have water all the time. They're they're super happy. I want to know how Marie got that fish to jump. <laughs> they don't do that very often, and she managed to get multiple. Maybe she was a circus trainer. Breaches. She could be. She. <laughs> She's got a, lot of a woman of many wonders and talents. <laughs> Yeah. Um, Marie texted me at five thirty this morning saying that they just finished editing the last video for tomorrow. <laughs> So this has been a quite a quite a thing. And Marie, thank you so much. This footage is so beautiful. Um, well, we're getting the Ceanothus here, you know, the early bloomers, which we don't normally see on the tour. Yeah, we've noticed this year, one of the themes has been, even though it's been a dry year, Ceanothus has kind of had a pretty show-stopping year all over the city. So this area back here, you're seeing um, these pergolas uh, have, have grape on them, have grapes, Roger's Red, I think. And um, that's been a really successful planting for us. It um, provides a ton of shade in the winter and these porches are really nice places to hang out in the winter. But then because they're deciduous in, I mean, in the, in the summer and then in the winter, it's nice that they let the light in. This probably lowered the temperature in the back of our house by, you know, five or five to 10 degrees in yeah. the summer. It's, it's yeah. Wow. Really yeah. That's amazing. We're just At one point we let those grapes grow over the roof itself, which was fun, but also brought in a lot of pests. So we had to dial that ambition back a little bit. Yeah, those things will just, <laughs> it feels like they grow 10 feet a year in every direction. Yeah, it, that, and, and also we got like a really heavy Grey Gardens vibe on this place at that point. So we thought. <laughs> oh, so crazy. this shooting star shot, I want to just point out that we saw the whole cycle of the plant there. We saw the, the flowers, we saw it starting to set seed, and then we saw last year's stock, which is beautiful um, as well. And here we are in the pool. You guys are the closest plant to pool ratio I've ever seen. Um, and it gets closer depending on how much we manage to stay on top of the, the pruning. You've, you see a lot of, um, in the back corner there, there's a lot of uh, red buckwheat, there's insalias, and there's um, 
uh, Santa Cruz Island book, we, all those guys just get really huge in the summer. They bloom, they trail into the water and sometimes we trim it, sometimes we don't. The garage has a Ribes aureum espaliate against it. Now you're seeing it a little later in the season where it fills out. Um, at the moment, it's actually full of blooms and they're turning into fruit. Um, and uh, that's been a really great stable plant for us too. It's really pretty. It, you know, gets a, it gets a rust on it, but we don't care. <laughs> And the like golden current, we just saw a wonderful local native. Um, One of the things I love about your garden too is just how willing you are to experiment and play. Can you talk a little bit about that process and how you guys make decisions? Yeah, so, so you know, the garden's evolved quite a bit over the years. Um, you know, and, and when people ask us about, you know, how they should set up our, their garden initially, a lot of times we just say, you know, it's going to change, let it grow in think about it every year and just play with it. Um, and that's the fun part about gardens. Yeah, we just kind of jump in and start doing it. We'll kick our idea around a little bit. And then at some point, we don't really get stuck in analysis paralysis. We just kind of jump in. And, do it. <laughs> and, and most of the time after we start, it changes from our oh, original yeah. concept. So, oh, yeah. you know, it's it's just being flexible and, and figuring out as you go along. Uh, and that's the fun part about it. Also, like one of the benefits of a trash-based aesthetic is that we can, it's kind of forgiving. So, you know, there's no right angles anywhere anyway, so. <laughs> and, and we saw the bees and, and we're seeing some wildlife. We're gonna get into your kind of amazing curation of wildlife in, in the urban core in a minute. But, um, well, I guess we should just get into that right now because we're seeing all this footage um, and we'll see more you've really created an oasis for, for life in the middle of the city. Uh, it's been really, it's been really amazing to see how much stuff came back on its own. And then some things we kind of have tempted in. So you saw like the, that goldfinch feeder, we'll get goldfinches anyway, um, feeding on like the asters and stuff, but feeding them early in the season just brings them in a little earlier. Having water features brings a ton of stuff in. And then, and also we don't, you know, we don't keep the garden, you know, perfectly clean. And we do that on, on purpose because we want to create habitat for insects and bugs and you know it works um, and some of this garden has moved away from something specifically for us and people and is more of a habitat. So so the bare ground is really useful for native bees as, as Corey said like you know old logs and stuff are useful for them too. We found salamanders have made their way into here somehow oh, obviously nice. lizards tons of pollinators the things that I only would normally see on a hike pop up in the garden even though this is just an isolated little patch of of, of native uh, plantings in the middle of a pretty dense area of the city. Um, the one thing we did consciously bring in was the frogs. The pond you're looking at here is, um, and we might get to some more of that later, but uh, the, the local tree frog, Pseudochrys hypochondriaca. We brought some uh, tadpoles in from a friend's property in Santa Monica. So it's the local species. And, and our, our property is right on a historic creek bed so that fed into Bologna Creek. So oh, wow. there probably were historically a lot of frogs here anyway. And we've had a stable population for probably over five years now. Yeah. They come back every year. Wow. And, you know, throughout the garden during the year. This water feature is so cool and um, impressive. And what we're seeing right now is this winter landscape where things are just greening up and there's some negative space kind of. Um, and I, you guys talked about that the other day, how, how important negative space is in a native plant garden. Yeah, and over time, I think we've become more comfortable with having some open space. Some of it's seasonal. So one of the payoffs of the dormant season, I hope this plane's not too low, um, <laughs> a helicopter rather, uh, the, um, that's the city though, uh, is, is that you know the negative space gets revealed and then you sort of enjoy that. And sometimes we have things in it that you can specifically see like you know pieces of rubble and sometimes it's just empty. And it's important to be able to deal with negative space with our, you know, the dormancy cycles. We, we embrace dormancy. And so during the dormant cycles, we have more negative space. And when you, you want to plan around that and just embrace dormancy and work with it. So this is the obsessive um, collector side of, of you guys. Um, plant hoarders, hashtag plant hoarders. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I like to say that because native plants wasn't niche enough, we decided to get into native bulbs. So, um, and then they're not always that easy to find and started propagating them. So these are tons and tons and tons of, you know, different themids and, um, and up until now, we really haven't had room to even put them all. So a lot of them have been given to friends, but that area in the front might be a lot of bulbs for next year. Here's one of our frogs. Yeah, so now we're going to get a little wildlife medley. Really quick on bulbs. Uh, Theodore Pan Foundation will be building a new bulb house, a, a lath house, Redwood lath house this summer that'll be publicly accessible. So we're going to be 
talking to you guys a lot about your expertise with bulb growing. Can't wait. And there's that slender salamander. That you, you guys actually have. have collected a ton of bulbs we haven't even seen before. I need to come in and like, and and buy a bunch, a bunch of alliums and things. So th these um, these bees are all. Uh, this is a, a load of the native bees that have been documented in the well, that's not a bee, um, in the in the garden. Um, we've had a couple of graduate students, Jesus Cepeda and, and another, have come in and studied the impact of native planting on on pollinators, and it's been pretty cool. There's hoverfly. Yeah, I mean it's amazing if you if you kind of build it, they will come, and you've attracted all this life. Um, and it's in mid-city. People are asking where, where they are. They're pretty far. I mean, what's the nearest natural? Pico and Crenshaw is the biggest, is the biggest uh, intersection. And then, so we're really kind of midway between, say, for natural areas like Baldwin Hills and Griffith Park. It's several miles either direction before you get to, you know, kind of a hillside that's even undeveloped, let alone native. There's a gum plant. Gum plant is, I think, an unsung hero for wildlife. Oh, yeah. It's, it's a nice garden thing, too. It blooms, just never stops blooming. Yeah, yeah cedar waxwing was really pretty. Noriko Smallwood was studying the birds that the garden brought in and she got the great All right, so we're transitioning. Um, we're going ahead about six weeks now, heading towards the spring landscape. You can already see a lot more flowers. Um, so things have started to, to peak and- That monkey flower on the right, that, that's it's probably been here six or seven years now. It's one of our oldest. There yeah. are Diplacus pinicius from San Diego. So not exactly local, but pretty close. And it's been pretty happy. And we have clay soil, but it's, uh, you know, the, the roots are fairly shaded. It's growing next to a plinth. Um, there's other plants around it. And a lot of these plants, I think, have benefited from having a little bit of density. It keeps the soil uh, temperature and moisture content moderated. Lup Lupinus truncatus there, which just self seed. It's not the showiest lupin, but they're certainly easy around here. So they just keep coming back. And we saw the manzanita that was blooming earlier now setting fruit. That was a Dr. Hurd manzanita. This is a volunteer sage that popped up. I think the parents are probably uh, Point Sal, which is that mounding Salvia leucophylla and one of the low growing green ones like Sonomensis or Dara's Choice. And uh, that's a really nice one. It's there's one of the point cells. We have a lot of point cell sages. We like them. We like the growth habit. They're kind of a compact mound, and they get these delicate pink flowers on them. It's nice to have a lot of different sages. They've all got a slightly different bloom time, so you kind of keep the whole thing going by having different species in the garden. There's the giant coreopsis in the foreground, and if you guys don't follow at giant coreopsis, I would highly recommend it. Very entertaining. Lots of good ecological knowledge and you guys give so much information on your Instagram account. It's it's really fun to to not only see the amazing things that are happening in your yard, but also get like detailed information about the species and and what you're looking at. So it's really kind of, it's kind of verbose sometimes. We started putting a lot more stuff in the story on the okay. giant coreopsis, just because that way you can keep up with it. You don't have to worry about, you know, doing a lot of long edits. This boulder in the middle of the pond, by the way, I, we didn't get footage of how it was engineered, but Corey did this crazy kind of, uh, it's sitting on a its sitting on a custom welded platform. So it's suspended in the water. Yeah. <laughs> out through the boulder. Yeah. Oh my gosh. That's gonna be my new career is boulder drilling. <laughs> we could have somebody else do it, which would have been cheaper and easier, but why do that? No, it's fun. There's a uh, Red Maids. Those, are, those come back on their own every year too. That, that's one of the few natives that actually can thrive in a totally disturbed urban environment. You'll see them growing in like sidewalk cracks in, in right. the city sometimes. And this, um, this, this Coreopsis also, John Coreopsis was a volunteer. That's amazing. Wow. I, how did you not kill that when you installed that uh, giant I, feature? I was 90% certain I was going to lose it. And, uh, but it actually had its best year this year. So, you know, I, I, it's a little bit more sheltered by a boulder and probably a little bit more moisture now. Yeah. And I don't think they have really big root structures. I'm, I'm pretty sure like. I don't um, even know. Well, you, you're the one that dug it in half. You tell me. <laughs> <laughs> There's a nice, uh, nice for We've gotten, um, we have a lot of colors of, of desert mallow 
Um, and most of them we got from our friend Jay Shields, who pro whose garden, if you haven't been on it on the, on the real tour, you got to see. It's just his collection of penstemons and sphralsia now his bulbs are really beautiful. But he's got a whole spectrum of them and he's given us seedlings over the years. So now we have a spectrum of them too. It's a really nice, nice yeah. thing. These are a great choice because they're they're a little forgiving that you can give them summer water more so and um, you can kind of reflush growth on them. We've been sticking them in the parkway too, and they take some abuse, obviously, that way. Oh, yeah. They've managed to survive. Well, they're you know desert mallow. They come from the desert, so they kind of just take take what they get in terms of water. Uh, well, including like getting stepped on by shoes <laughs> and fast food wrappers. <laughs> they're not. <laughs> it's a garden of trash, literally. <laughs> um, and we saw the monkey flowers. Monkey flowers, another kind of thing where there's just so many color varieties to play with. Yeah, we've experimented with a lot of them. I would say in this location, we're LA Basin again, kind of between Hollywood and the 10. Um, and uh, the, the straight species do pretty well. Those are pretty robust. And then the jelly bean series is pretty stable. A lot of the other ones kind of come and go and you just kind of make peace with that. Here the we one, there was the, the island. What's the island one? It used to be called Flemingy. I'm not sure if it still is. That was this lasted a long time. I need to get another one. Hmm. A lot of the island endemics have done well here, actually. Um, the buckwheats, the monkey flowers, the, um, the cherries, the sway, well, yeah, suede taxifolia. So I'm, I'm uh, getting a question about watering. How, how often and how do you water? It's all by hand and it depends on the season. So if we have a dry spring, I'll probably supplement a bit more than I typically would. Uh, in the summer, we cut back a lot. Um, you're more likely to overwater and kill things in the summer than underwater, um, especially as things start to get more mature. They just don't need it. Yeah. Um, so some of the some of the uh, annuals, we'll we'll probably give them a little bit more water just to get them to bloom a little bit more. But it's for us, it's it's got to be by hand just because our it the, it varies so much here. And some things have just taken an astonishing amount of neglect and done really well. Like Ceanothus, we don't touch them in the summer. Manzanitas, we don't, even though it's tempting because sometimes they look a little rough, but they're better off. We find that they're better off just not getting the water. Some of the bulbs that we really like, this is Ceanothus aminus from the Sierra foothills. And that's, that's a really easy one to grow. It's really cute. There's a fritillary um, cross with biflora and perdii. So it's got attributes to both, but it's still got that drab kind of purple, brown and yellow coloration which i think is really pretty if, if, if people are just kind of coming to to native plant gardening for the first time and seeing this what you're seeing with these bulbs is kind of like the one of the hardest things one of the most challenging skilled bits of gardening and these guys are really amazing at it so some of those things like the fertile areas can be very tough to grow well we create hydro zones and basically those are areas that get absolutely no water in the summer yeah that is the one trick to bulbs is they're very easy to rot off or not the one trick it is the a major trick there are many other tricks re required to do them well but rotting is a huge concern there yeah, that cool that side of planting is so cool this nice, is mount, blo mount nice blooms on that mountain mahogany which uh you know they they bloom a lot people don't think of them as plants you things you put in for the blooms but the blooms are beautiful the seeds are beautiful and everything pollinates them and the birds like it the bees love them yeah. and they're easy here it's your sage that's another one that's really easy and fast growing around here another point sal this is one of the oldest ones in the garden i think that's probably 10 10 12 years old wow it's just it's gotten pretty big but We've got the, uh, the the vacuum here. There must be a lot of work kind of keeping the, the plant debris because here you see the, <laughs> the buckwheats growing over the water. Yeah, in the summer, those are really nice. They bloom at the back of the pool. There's a, the squirrels planted a Quercus agrifolia back there. I don't know if we will we catch a shot of it, but we've just left it. I, I'm assuming at some point that's gonna start fighting with the pool too. So far, it's they've played pretty well together. Mm -hmm. You have a bees bliss sage growing in the front. We have a lot of that. That's really, really tough. And again, just draws uh, kind of every pollinator imaginable and makes a huge carpet of purple flowers. Um, it doesn't look terrible in the off season, though it certainly pulls back quite a bit. 
those are we think those are old water heater tanks we found those in the on the back of the lot probably buried sometime in the 30s and we yeah we kind they kind of look like unexploded ordnance <laughs> i like the i like the the rivets the rust i like rust these uh, discs you see in the foreground, I'm pointing as if anybody can see what I'm pointing at, but there, those right there is, uh, that's one way that we've hydrozoned uh, for bulbs. So within, if something's inside a ring, we know not to water it in the summer. And um, so oh, here nice. you have this Catalina. Because that's kind of a trick. Uh, if you want to put them, most people do their bulbs in, in pots and we do that, but we try to keep a lot of them in ground too. But you need to, you need to demark. That's Silo. That's Silo, our cat, our neighbor's cat. cat. Uh, you need to mark it so that you don't hit them with water in the summer because when they're dormant, you don't see anything. It's just bare ground and weeds if you don't stay on top of it. There's another volunteer, giant Coreopsis. There's our beehive. We're getting all kinds of questions in the chat and I wonder if you guys wouldn't mind as we head to our next garden, just kind of hanging out and answering some of those questions in the chat, um, sure. just responding. Sure. It, the kind of the, the the way that you guys conceptualize the garden with the end of oil and you know the continental plates like that you've made all these kind of conceptual frameworks within which you've built all this stuff is so interesting to me and it's just so beautiful and i love that you've thought to that level of of kind of what you're representing and then followed up with such amazing you know, horticulture skills it's, it's really remarkable thanks Thank you'll you. see you'll see a, a better version of that with andreas and Karen's garden, but <laughs> that was the idea. <laughs> <laughs> it's so cool. And it, it just shows if anyone needs some inspiration, um, this is mostly DIY. Like you guys do all this yourself. Yeah. That's the, that's the fun part about it. So beautiful. There's the giant Coreopsis. Remember at giant Coreopsis for all sorts of knowledge. There's Penstemon, uh, uh, Parashi, which we just found out. I saw, actually, somebody on Instagram gave me the plant ID because I always wondered why that Centranthifolius had that lovely magenta color. And that's because it's not Centranthifolius. It's a cross of that and what, Spectabilis or Pseudospectabilis? Yeah, showy Pensamen and Scarlet Bugler, uh, Pensamen Centranthifolius and Pensamen Spectabilis hybrid, which is a naturally occurring hybrid. I want to come get cuttings of that for TPF because <laughs> it's hard to find in, in the ornamental trade, but it's actually somewhat common in nature. Not common, but you do see them every now and then. I wish you would because sooner or later, you know, you always lose it. And I, we like to, for our favorite plants, we do try to make sure you guys and friends and everybody have have uh, propagation of it so that we can replace ours if necessary. Yeah. Those Theonocus ray Hartmans have been abused so badly. Sorry, the cat. <laughs> the cat's cat's pushing, the, pushing the computer. Uh, just just it, they were growing baking against a fence and then when we moved our fence over Corey dug them up and moved them as mature plants and I they thought still there was no chance they were going to survive wow so that's impressive yeah. and i, that's I imagine a, on a wet year this is this probably blooming much more profusely um yeah yeah so we kind and of see wears on it probably around here it probably peaks in kind of mid to late april but you can see this is a creek. There's a you know a creek feature running through this this crack. That's it's meant to suggest kind of a you know a, a, a creek running through a fault fault area, uh, as they often do in California. And um, so because there's year-round water, that really I mean grows like crazy and it gets a lot of stuff in it. So that miner's lettuce just came up and see. Yeah, we have a, a couple uh, stream bank orchids in there that just pop up every year. And, and you hear in the frogs. And I can just hear faintly the. People ask us whether our neighbors uh, have complained that we have this loud chorus of frogs for six months of the year, but uh, we've only ever gotten nice com comments about it. Maybe the people that don't like it have just not said anything, but you can hear them for, for quite a ways. So, we've done a lot of Dudleyas in these vertical cracks. So here's an example of Pulverantula um, growing, growing out of a vertical crack. And our experience with them is that when they're happy, they're super happy. And when they're slightly unhappy, they just die. So this one is pretty happy. It's been there a long time. And those um, inflorescences get really long. They probably get, you know, 20 inches long. Beautiful. We have some questions about succulents. So that is a native succulent. Uh, and that's our porch kitty that just passed away. A lot of people from the tour know him because he lays across the sidewalk and 
greets everybody. Greets everybody. So. Wow. Well, I am inspired. Amazing, you Chris guys. Chris and Tori, that it's such a work of art, and it's it's just on so many levels, it's it's truly amazing. And there are a lot of questions and um, and comments you might want to read through on the chat. And if you have a minute to answer, we would really appreciate it. Sure. I um. I think we're going to now transition to our next garden. So we're really going to switch gears. So we have eight gardens over the next two days. The first one starting off with a bang. Thank you guys. Much appreciated. We'll see you soon. See you soon. Have a good show. Thanks, guys. Thank you. So we are now going to, going to move over to a public landscape that is open right now. So you can go and see this one in person. It's one of the few places that uh, on the tour that you actually can go see. So I, I encourage you once you learn a little bit more about this space to go see it in person. And I'm gonna queue up the video and Erin, where are we headed next? We are headed to um, right near Chinatown. We are headed to LA Historic Park um, where we're gonna be, I just saw Luis Rincon pop on. Hello, Luis. How are you? Hi Erin, how are you doing? Good morning. Good, how are you? I'm good, I'm glad to be on this tour. And, uh, uh, and and featuring Los Angeles State Historic Park, it's a really awesome experience. So it's cool. been great. Awesome. Luis uh, is a board member of Theater Pain Foundation, as, as well as being um, the uh, volunteer, uh, uh, excuse me, the community outreach coordinator at State Historic Park. And we our video is ready to go. So Luis, we're going to start here with a little bit of a, a promo video, and then we'll just start what we're seeing. Oh, I did. Yeah. Hey. Thank you, Evan. to the winter landscape here. And this is a fairly new park. It opened in 2017, Luis? And yeah, it it's 2017 on Earth Day. We got to open a Los Angeles State Historic Park. Yeah, I got, I got to join the state parks in 2014 and it was a construction site. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> it's always a delight for me to go there and see this beautiful landscape. Wow, so you've got to see it through the whole the whole process, and it's the just the existence of this park was um, quite a a battle. Can you tell us a little bit about the history of? Uh, there's there's that's a history. It's a historical park. Um, sits on the banks of the LA River. A little bit about the more recent history is that in 1985 it was decommissioned by the Southern Pacific Railroad. And uh, it was it was just like an open space. They used to sell Christmas trees there because it was easy for them to pull pull them off the rail carts that of the the lines that still existed there. But in in the 1989, the 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 Chinatown Yard Alliance. It was a social justice struggle. Uh, 30, 35 different groups, 65 public meetings. Uh, the community organized and 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 got together and really and, and challenged the developers. It was going to be a million square feet of industrial development. These big box warehouses to create jobs was the was the reasoning. And when Chinatown, the residents of Chinatown, Dogtown, South Los Angeles, kind of heard about this, they're like, "Wait a minute! It's we need some more uh, parks." You know what a better thing to do instead of an industrial park we should have a park for our kids to grow up and run around in fly a kite and uh we get to see that here and 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 the community organized and won and it's a it's a really awesome story of uh, social justice and advocacy for green space and and parks in 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 los angeles you could see the downtown skyline which is definitely one of our um most awesome features in in the park and and also you know we hope that this can inspire connections too. So 
uh, Luis, we're seeing, I'm gonna yeah. pause right here actually. Um, oh, let me pause this right here. I'm gonna pause on this image because um, we're seeing the, the embodiment of mixed use space here. We're seeing, you know, areas for recreation, areas for um, leisure, and there are lawns. Someone just made a comment on that, but people use those lawns. It's an important part of recreating the park. But there's also a, a whole ecological um, element to this. Can you speak to that biodiversity perspective on how on this mixed use um, of the park? Yeah, I'll, I'll speak to the lawns because that's the easiest. So obviously lawns um, uh, make money and allows people kind of creating a safe access. And and so we definitely, uh, we have tons of lawn here and it's it's what's, it's the biggest challenge, but we also want to speak to people always, uh, the irrigation here at the park, just to speak to the lawn impact feature is, uh, it's all recycled water. We get another use before. Uh, we water our grass and, and one of the features of uh, LA Department of Water and Power is that they get to they get to showcase this park that all the all the native plants, all the all the plant material grown at this park is all recycled water. So just to speak to that. But also um, early on in the construction, one of the one of the archaeologists said she, she just, she's they were remediating the site. That means they were cleaning it from its from its in, uh, po, you know it's a post-industrial site. So it had all kinds of waste and lead arsenic uh, heavy metals in in the soil and so once they remediated and brought in new uh, construction fill one of the archaeologists told me hey there's going to be some rich biodiversity not going on just on top of the soil but beneath the soil as well so it's going to enrich this this park as as they started using a, a native plant pellet the goal was ultimately like 50 percent of the plant material that was going to go in here including was trying to be a uh, California native plants. So for for myself and for we hope that people can can go there and look at and, and watch the birds. We also had a coyote, a skunk, and when we have these these um, like a higher level uh, predator like a coyote in the park, it really uh, it really is a uh, it brings meaning to 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 the work of all the native uh, the native plants, the work of the volunteers that they've introduced. So it's creating this this. Um, this, this little ecosystem uh, within the park that, that, that these wildlife kind of find familiar. So that's always, it's always a validation of the work. So there's the toy on the jogger, beautiful embodiment of that, um, that mixed use. Yeah, we, 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 yeah, we, we love, we love the toy on, we love to see the birds. That's one of the, the plants that, that, that our, our maintenance crew is really, really loves and is proud of. So a whole army of, of maintenance folks. And it's, it's, it's a beautiful anyone, that, that, that uh -huh, go ahead. Sorry. Well, I was going to say, if anyone joined us last night um, and heard Marcos Trinidad talking about, uh, you know, visions for Los Angeles and just realizing that there are a lot of different people out there who have different needs and desires and, and recreation access to the space to have a picnic. You know, many people live in apartments and don't necessarily have that. So it is important to provide that in a public way. And, and the fact that can be done with biodiversity as a consideration as well is a pretty awesome vision for the future, I think. One of the things yeah. I love about this park too is that there, you know, you have people using it for so many different reasons, but because there's so like this wetland zone, for example, because there are so many native plants and the wildlife has come back, people are really curious. There were moments when Marie and I were out um, photographing and filming where we were, we were just taking pictures of, uh, it, it's just a little sparrow, but a whole group of people came over and they were like, oh, what kind of bird did you spot there? Like, you know, they, and people do spot rare and interesting um, wildlife here. So um, even though they might not have come for that, people are, um, are finding it and getting excited about it. Uh, and yeah, I was going to say the wetland habitat allows us to, to kind of, um, we see some mallards there when the when the bioswale kind of fills up when after a rain you could see you could see some mallards. Um, there's some kill deer that have have occupied the space, uh, and it's also like I said, it's also validating to see um, that they're that they're occupying th that space right next to the LA River. Uh, this is a gateway park. We hope that this and it's divided into different nodes. There's like uh, people coming off the gold line can 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 come out and then there's the, the most uh, industrial the urban node there's the 
there's also the like this wildlife section as they get closer to the LA River. We hope that they get you know they get connected to the the beautiful native plants, uh, the native plant palette, and we hope that they get to see you know birds and butterflies and. It's always a delight for for to use this as a as kind of a living laboratory, also to to showcase to 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 the public and also to young to to young school children that they can continue to to use this. Um, done a lot of uh, plantings with with some the local schools, Solano Elementary, Ant Street, uh, Albion, and uh, Castellar in Chinatown. It's been it's been great to share that 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 experience in the park with with this. Uh, with the community, it's really it's it's their park, and it's validating to see uh, the youth use the space and and the mixed use of of people go there to jog and the passive recreation. Um, there's a ultimate frisbee group that comes. There's there's, <laughs> there's different. There's yoga in the park. There's uh, last Sunday three different groups organized little meetups and do yoga here at the park. So it's always it, it's always great that that people can also get connected to to their public space and, and also connected to, to their native plants. And, and, and we hope that uh, to inspire that at this park. Those beautiful Dudley is there. I think this, what, to what you're just saying, Luis, um, this visionary panel last night, I kept thinking of this park when, when things were being said about community coming together, um, nature not needing to be, you know, in, in a yard, it can, it can be a community endeavor. And here it is, this is the embodiment of that idea. And people can join you in working on some of these areas too, right? Luis, you have a whole crew of volunteers that come out and, and work in the park? At the park currently, there isn't. There, there ha the California State Parks Foundation has uh, assisted us in, in making a lot of these, uh, introducing uh, different plantings. And so, so there will be in the future due to COVID, unfortunately, uh, a lot of our public programming and our volunteering has stopped, but, um, you know, we continue to do uh, volunteering over at, at, at Rio on a very like uh, minimal scale. Um, we want to continue uh, uh, because of the volunteers. They love they love the space and they love being outdoors. And it's and it's really the health of the community, uh, which is the thought behind a lot of these programs. So beautiful. Um, we're going to try to touch the history briefly. And right now, what are we seeing here, Luis? Play. What you're seeing is the Zanja Madre, like the mother ditch, the first specific water project of the city of Los Angeles. And there you see the, the gold line running through it. Um, and and this this is like, this is the water. The, 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 the closest uh, Tongva village uh, there is called Yangna. And, and the, the Tongva lived around the river. But the Spanish, when they came in, in, you know, in, 17, in the 1780s, 1781 established El Pueblo, they brought the water to them in this series of ditches. And so that actually was the first kind of layout of the city. And it was a very touches into our, our agricultural past. The Sanjero, um, the was one of the most highest paid during the Spanish period, uh, who sent the water to different uh, agricultural plots. And those 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 zanjas, those initial were the initial markings are some of our streets here in Los Angeles. So it's 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 a really uh, it's like a it's almost like a planning infrastructure that kind of set out the layout of the city. Yeah, the city, and then it it evolves to the river station. What, what is that? Yeah, 18, 1876, um, the railroad, the Transcontinental Railroad, lands in Los Angeles. It's a it's a passenger and a freight depot. There you see what the park uh, used to be for almost over a hundred years. It was a rare, it was belonged to the Southern Pacific, Union Pacific, then Southern Pacific Railroad, and uh, it was it was this these this um, this railroad that brought the growth to Los Angeles. It was this piece of infrastructure that that they, they that brought people from the East Coast to to LA State, the grounds of LA State Historic Park. This is often seen as the Ellis Island of Los Angeles when immigrants first came to the East Coast. This at this particular place, this is what they saw. They saw the Elysian Park, and they saw that you know, they saw what was downtown. Uh, definitely smaller buildings, but this is this is where they first landed in Los Angeles. And, uh, and you, um, you mentioned the uh -huh. the environmental degradation that that caused. And so, as you know, the, the community battle to turn this into park space, which is an amazing story. I wish we had more time because we could talk about this for hours. But 
We're going to move now to it becoming a state park and this really wonderful project um, that kind of helped revitalize the space, the conceptual art yeah. project, which we'll see in just a second here, it should pop up on, on the screen. Yes, this is this is this is kind of the linkage. The the the, the one who started the revitalization of the LA River was of course Louis McAdams with, with Friends of the Los Angeles River. But this is Lower and Bonds, not a cornfield project, which in and it brought um, engagement and attention. That she she was using the medium of corn to to remediate the soil. She knew that this was a, a form of rail yard and um, needed and needed to 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 extract some of the pollutants. Um, some of the folks from the, around the commuters were trying to eat the corn and they were like, no, no, don't, don't eat the corn because <laughs> it, <laughs> it's used as a, uh, it's used as a, a great uh, remediator. And this brought, it was 20 acres of corn in downtown Los Angeles. It definitely brought attention. There were storytelling circles. There were so many great programs done out of that, which almost leads to the current project, which is the water wheel uh, project that's coming. Uh, we're going to be the recipients. It's bending the river back into the city um, the, the history of Los Angeles has a, 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 a the city of Los Angeles has a great history of, of using the water of the LA River. So this is going to be a, a water wheel that's going to be installed using water from the LA River and irrigating uh, this beautiful landscape that you see with more. Um, yeah. So it'd be a little creek that's running through there, and it and it does touch up. Uh, the archaeologist was was able to when they were remediating the soil, they found sand and silt and. Um, some of the rocks that they found there, some of these granite boulders, smooth boulders they used in the landscaping of the park. Yeah, so that, that was Lauren Vaughn and Metabolic Studio, um, which I, I see people are putting in the chat. There's all sorts of other art, like this really cool project. Louis yeah, this is, a fa this is Fallen Fruit. This is also touching upon that these are 32 Valencia oranges. Uh, this, this helps us touch about the second gold rush of California. Um, Pierce disease, uh, this is also uh, the wine growing area of Los Angeles. So uh, in, in Orange County, for example, Pierce, and, Pierce disease hit hard and uh, it was, they had, and they, they introduced uh, citrus. Here's a picture from, an uh, older picture from 2016, 2017. So this is the development a, community effort. Here. Yeah, this was done with with uh, large volunteer effort. This is our, our friends, Latino outdoors, uh, people from where they meet homes, um, and, and different different folks from 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 different organizations. Uh, Northeast Trees. Uh, we're blessed to have our partners, uh, Los Nogales Nursery at Debs Park. Shout out to Marcos. They lended some of the plant material that used to to. To, to you know introduce this into the into the park so it was we're great to have the partners it's basic the, the park is really uh extension of the community and that's and that's kind of the vision that that it's a shared that is a shared such a resource and people can feel inspired um to so here we are traveling uh, uh six to eight weeks into the future um in the spring landscape we can already see it's greened up and we'll hone in more on the plants now so i you guys use a lot of mugwort yeah, a mugwort was introduced, kind of uh, an hydro seed in, in the in, in the seed bank, and it just it's just kind of taken over. Uh, it's a beautiful plant. We get to introduce the the riparian the riparian zone. Um, I introduce this to to a lot of the folks when they when they, we do a lot of the plantings in the riparian area. Uh, it's river sage, as it's known in in north northern California, with some through from some of the tribes. This, There's an uh, evening primrose. Evening primrose, which is uh, another another plant that will just kind of take over, which is probably yeah. kind of what you want in that landscape. But it, as a garden plant, you got to be a little careful with this one because it can just go crazy on you. <laughs> the birds were just my, going crazy for this too. My my biggest delight is that the that the, our maintenance folks can 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 really recognize that plant. They're like, "What is that?" And it really inspired them. It's so beautiful, like it just that their connection. So that's that's another idea that that we hope to. Um, blue eyed grass here. It's a hope, another idea that we hope to 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 have have the people who work there who work the land can take away can take away this knowledge. And that's something that I'm I'm delighted to work on with with uh, Theodore Payne foundation so that's, yeah, that's also that's that. good we're so excited um 
another evening primrose. This is, I think this is the beach primrose, if I'm correct. That's our sun, beach sun cup, which is another type of. Um, it's a, yeah, and, and someone asked, is there, was that yarrow? And then that was yarrow. And it's growing wild in the in the park, and that uh, was also introduced. And there's our, our poppies coming up. And Teresa, the, the purple flower was the blue eyed grass, Cesarinchium bellum, which is a, a very nice, very um, nice uh, and iris. Yeah, and and one of, one of the ideas behind uh, the plant palette in the park was that we're trying to include all the all the plants of California knowing that this is the gateway park this is going to be the gateway to connect folks to, to state parks and we hope the whole watershed and all the park spaces throughout the connection to the LA River so that's that's a definitely an underlying theme within 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 the park yeah it's amazing too that you can see not only the skyline of downtown LA but you can also see the mountains you can see the San Gabriels from this park yeah, we we go you know, the 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 views of at the park are are, are amazing and um, a lot a lot of folks uh, definitely come here for their picnics and 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 use the space. We're always delighted and and to be able to showcase our park for it's a lot it's a hidden gem for a lot of folks they haven't they haven't been they're like oh when was this park introduced? A lot of people coming back and visiting to LA are are always delighted to be like oh. What, what, what where was what was be, what was before and so that was that's always an inspiring um, as a, here's our, our oaks our quercus agrifolia and these oaks too are I mean I can't wait to see this the way that these oak trees fill in in the next you know 20 30 100 years it's going to be there are so many oak trees it's going to be an oak woodland yeah we we have some more uh, plants uh, that were donated. There was uh, uh, Kevin Kevin De Leon had had was asked us what do we need, and so uh, those these large specimen oaks. There was large also sycamore species uh, introduced into the park. Um, so it was it was it's it's great to be able to bring these were at a construction site. So there are these huge like fifty thousand dollar a piece to kind of move these oaks into into there, and it did this create. A lot of folks came back and after we planted them and they were like, hey, God, when did those grow here? <laughs> and there's this like 70, 80 year old oak in the middle of the wetlands. And it's oh it, and that's one thing, shade is a resource at our park. And all the plants, everybody's like, there needs to be some more shade in this park. And um, and it's, it, it's, uh, it's, it's great. Good things take time um, to grow. Yes, up, grow yes. This is a really cool um, salvia. This is salvia cedar census. The, the, yeah, this this is our, our newly planted um, uh, scent garden. We hope, and we hope that we can continue that. A beautiful ceanothus there. And it's blooming right now. It looks so beautiful. Uh, yeah. So as we started, that, you're open. People can come and see this. Carol, yes, that, that was Baja Blanca. Um, And, the, and the, that that plant we I purchased for one of our partners, uh, <laughs> the the native the native plant nursery Artemis, Artemisia down the street. So it was such a great oh, resource. I think I uh, see a little Nicole Calhoun Artemisia nursery coming up on the schedule. Shout out to <laughs> Artemisia. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's, she's a delight. Um, got to meet Nicole at a volunteer volunteering for California State Parks. And so that was, it's, that was great. Um, we put this shot in because we see all the insect damage on this mule fat. And first we thought we got to cut it out. It's all this damage. And then we thought, you know what? Is that something to cut out or is there beauty in that? Because something is eating that and we don't actually have no idea what it is, but Maybe that's part of rethinking how we look at the landscape. That all, not all insects are pests. We don't have to kill every insect that lands on our plants. Plants don't have to look perfect all the time. And that's kind of a way of reconfiguring the way that we look at our, our uh, ornamental landscapes so that they're not just about being pretty for us, but they're about being part of an ecosystem. Yeah, it's, 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 it's something really, re really awesome that, that inspires inquiry because when, when, when people see scales or, or whatnot in the, 
especially our maintenance crew, it, it kind of inspires them to further like engage and take care of the landscape. You know, they're, they're, the, they're, they're the people who are most on the ground, who are, who are there, or that, that's their, their main, their, their, their goal and task. So it's really requires, it's an opportunity for, for, for them to learn and, and, and really kind of engage the, the landscape and really, and, and, and just kind of see and be like, well, what's, what's eating this, what's eating this meal fat? what is the scale why is it is it from how we learned a lot that the in the summer a lot of the recycled water has has high high density more minerals as it does in the winter when it when it rains so we're we were able to to learn a little bit more and we continue to to learn as this park uh, matures and and progresses so it's it's you know i'm delighted for the opportunity but it's also um we hope that it creates more opportunities for 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 that learning for that learning uh, component as as uh, as managers of this space. Absolutely, and that we just saw some beautiful deer grass waving in the wind. Uh, forms a really nice kind of structural feature. That's a really good choice to plant that um, in that way. And then sycamores, springtime, they've leafed out. This is a deciduous plant. So we saw those early landscapes that looked, the winter landscapes, this was just trees without um, any leaves. Now we have the beautiful new growth on a sycamore. Yeah, this uh, this beautiful this beautiful sycamore. I mean, we 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 always like to show our some of our the school. It's always like you know feel it, touch it, and we it's one of those that inspires uh, the yeah. inspires the 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 children to think about how the plant is linked with birds. Uh, it's linked. Uh, it, it it lines the bird's nest. So it's it's. This is great. We're seeing some great. These are our grapevines. Yeah. So can you tell us a little bit about your little grape project that you've been working on? Yeah. There's so so we use landscaping, uh, Vitis uh, Rogers Red along the along the fence line, and we've also used Vitis uh, Gridiana. And there's a there's a new project on the way, a grape garden uh, to reintroduce some grapes, which dominated the uh, Southern California as the main growing grape. Of, uh, of the region. So this is the first wine country. There's a interpretive uh, component there where, where there was, uh, there wasn't corn planted on the ground. There's no historical record by the art project was called not a cornfield, but there was vines planted on site. So there, there, it does give us an, an opportunity to, to learn a little bit more about vines, learn a little bit, make those connections through history. And we did, we did try, we did some garden wine this, this, uh, this past season, one, one one good thing that came out of the pandemic. So we made we made some garden wine, we made some port, <laughs> and it was fun. It's a fun uh, to kind of experience the landscape on, on that depth to 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 grow to touch upon the history. We hope it's an activity that we can continue uh, doing. And but but yeah, we want to. It not only is a landscaping feature, people are like, "Well, what are those? Are those grapes?" And I'm like, "Yeah, this is this is Rogers Red. It's it's a cross between you know Alicante Boucher." And uh, Vitis Californica, so it's 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 meant to to create that linkage, not only like through the plant, but also through through the history and through through folks. But it, it was a fun it was a fun project. I tried the wine. I thought it was good. I liked it. <laughs> <laughs> you got our first vintage. Your, your preview. <laughs> um, we picked uh, we picked a little bit later in the season. We couldn't even get a gallon, but it was really nice to uh, uh, really nice to share with a lot of our folks. Um, and we hope honor. that that continues to inspire. Um, so I like that last shot because we just panned across the park. As you talked about interconnections, we saw some of the kind of interconnecting architectural features. And to me, it's just a visionary space. So everybody should go out and see it. And um, I'm really honored, Luis, to have you uh, uh, as a board member and to get to hang out and talk and move things forward. And I, I think you're doing amazing things there. So just thank you. No, uh, thank you. It, it's not. It's not myself. Like all of this takes a village. I see. I see Carlos here. I'm excited to see his 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 presentation, his panel. And uh, I mean, we're. I, I'm humble for the for the opportunity. I, little did I know that 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 the participation and the and with volunteers would would we create that would would be able to create something something so beautiful that's that's that we can share and and like the access and park access and, and, and it touches on so many different important points. So, so for, for myself, it's, uh, 
I'm, I'm humbled and, and delighted to work with, with Theodore Payne Foundation. And I hope that, that the, the little nodes of inspiration that were, that were, at, that were people got to see by, by seeing the landscape people can, can now visit. And, and we have a future project uh, to work on. We have Rio de los Angeles, a hundred acre parcel, just a couple, another former rail yard. So another headache to, to, but we're, we're excited to work on that project. But, um, I'm coming I'm in the future. More to come. More to come. So inspired. <laughs> Way much more to come. Thank you, Luis. That was so fun. We're going to now um, take a brief message um, from someone who's very special to the foundation. Our board president has done, I think he's been on the board for nine years now and has done an incredible job of just moving the organization forward, bringing us to new spaces. And um, he's about to end his tenure as board president, which makes me want to cry a little bit. But um, hopefully he'll stay on for, for at least another year as a board member. Um, I'm going to introduce everyone to our board president, DJ Peterson, and we will see DJ's garden tomorrow. He's an amazing garden in Filipino town. Hi, DJ. Hey, Evan. Hey, everybody. It's great to see you. Welcome to the garden tour. I see there's about 180 people online. You're spending part of your Saturday with Theater Pain Foundation in the garden, um, which is great to see. Um, like, like Luis, it's really an honor for me to serve on the board and to help in, 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 in any way that I can advance the cause of theater pain and native plants and conservation, um, biodiversity and in, in, in Southern California. Um, you know, for me, and I think for most of you, if not all of you, your garden was an important refuge in the past year. Um, making trips to Theodore Payne was so important for many of you to, to buy plants, to stock up walks in nature, to see um, California um, continuing, moving forward, even though it was so tumultuous. I spent a lot of time walking in, in the hills and the mountains and gardening. And those, the, the seasons I think have really, um, and the flowers and the wildlife has given us a sense of continuity, staying power, um, and certainly safety um, in, 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 in these times. Um, many of you, I've see, I'm seeing the name scroll across the bottom in, in, in the chat, many, many long time um, members. It's great to see you all participating in the chats, really amazing. Um, and there's so many new people. One of the things that's been really incredible this past year is our membership has grown tremendously. Um, people discovering um, native plants, or been, uh, but also discovering how important Theodore Payne is in their lives, um, for their gardens, for biodiversity, for Southern California. And so what, we've, what the board has done um, in honor of the past year and what Evan and Aaron and the whole team have accomplished is put together a challenge fund of $58,000. And this is a challenge match to all of you to contribute Thank you so much for buying your tickets and perhaps many of you have done actually well in the pandemic financially and perhaps you can kick in some extra money. Um, you can donate. It's really easy to donate on our website with your credit card. Um, there's the link right there showing up in the box. Um, so this $58,000 from the board, whatever you give will be up to that amount that all of you will be matched by the board. So this is really exciting. and and and. Evan has also talked about Patagonia in Pasadena has given us a number of items. Um, and so there's multiple drawings that you can be entered in and, and, and thanks to the Patagonia folks. How will this money be spent? Um, it will be used to invest in our people. Um, people like Aaron and Marie who have put on this show, Scott and the whole crew and also the crew behind the scenes in the nursery, the people that you meet and help um, that you get, you get help from every day. We're really working to um, really um, improve and, and, and give them the financial support and, uh, that, they, that, they, that they deserve. We're upgrading our headquarters in many important ways. Um, we are uh, engaging in new forms of outreach and engagement. This garden tour is one important, but we're also doing people to people. We get asked all the time for know-how and plants to donate. And it's your support, unrestricted support, that allows us to give away these plants to community groups, especially those in need. Um, and then finally, we're investing in technology and it's one donor, very generous gift, for instance, that allowed us to buy all the high-tech video equipment that is making this such an amazing garden tour. Um, I think 
which you've seen with the garden tour, with the music, the images, the dialogues that people we have on the screen. You know, uh, the pandemic has really motivated us to push in new directions and your support is tremendous. So again, we have a $58,000 um, challenge from the board. We're, give, we're putting it out to you. Please match us and please support the foundation. And I'm looking forward to the rest of the show today. Thanks a lot, Evan. Thank you, DJ. And thank you to our entire board of directors for supporting uh, the organization in such a meaningful way and working really hard. It's a volunteer position, but DJ and the team have put many, many hours in over the pandemic as we've had to face a lot of new challenges. Uh, we're all feeling very inspired, very good, and also realizing that there are new conversations we need to be having. And this conversation we're gonna head into next is a perfect example of that. I'm happy to say we do have an, another board member on this panel, um, and, and I will introduce uh, introduce everyone here in a sec. But um, this this conversation will be about design and the environment, and we're going to touch on environmental justice and how designers can help um, issues that are facing uh, real issues facing communities. How can our community, our native plant community, do better and connect? Um, to a more diverse audience and make sure that we understand the, uh, the situation in a more holistic way. And I will kind of just put out a disclaimer that some of this might be a little uncomfortable at times, particularly if you haven't had these conversations before. So um, we're, all in, we're all here kind of learning together. And I know that I'm on the process of learning and I just appreciate everyone being here and listening and, and moving forward together as a community. So thank you. I'm going to uh, introduce our moderator, who is a, a good, good friend of mine and a, a bandmate, actually. We have a band called Sage Against the Machine, which is, uh, which is pretty fun. So we, we do uh, have, we should check out our, uh, our Instagram shows that we do, and we're gonna do some live shows soon. But Nicole Calhoun, who's a great friend of mine, she is the owner of Artemisia Nursery. She's also a naturalist, a designer, and just an all around awesome plant person. Hi, Nicole. Hey, how's it going, you guys? Going well. So I think, Nicole, would you like to introduce our, our wonderful panel today? Yeah, actually, I'd really like everyone to have a chance to introduce themselves. Um, when we were meeting each other uh, last week and chatting about what we we're going to talk about today, it was just really cool hearing you guys each tell a little bit about yourselves. Um, so I'd like to have you do that again so that you can share it with our full audience. Um, so Andreas, if you're comfortable starting, I'd love to hear just a little bit about your, um, your background, like how you came into working with plants, what sort of work you do now. And uh, yeah, go ahead and get us started. Hi, Nicole. Hi, everybody. Thank you for um, inviting me to this panel. That's, um, I'm honored. Um, I grew up uh, in Hacienda Heights and uh, at the time when that whole area was um, transitioning from farmland and ranch land to housing. And that's kind of where my interests were originally, you know, peaked. And, you know, I've been lucky enough and, and definitely privileged enough to be able to follow those childhood interests all the way into my adulthood. So um, that was, you know, wandering around in the hills. Uh, I could walk up the street five minutes when I was a kid and we could go to a farm and get eggs and avocados. Um, and, um, and that was all in the early 60s. There were no markets close by. We had to drive to markets um, and, um, oh, it's the plants and the whole environment there became, you know, part of me at that time. And to such an extent that by the time my brother and I were about 10 years old and the development was really kicking into gear, um, we were so angry about it that we would go out in the hills there and we would pull out all the survey stakes for the guys who are gonna run their tractors the next day and just, you know, I'm sure we only slowed them down by a week or two, but, you know, it was our attempt at uh, monkey wrenching the, uh, you know, the development that was going on. And then by the time I was a teenager, it was all gone. 
Um, yeah, that's like quite an experience. I feel yeah. like a lot of people that grew up in, in especially Southern California, did see um, you know these large transitions of landscape. And I think one of the things you pointed out before too is that you were associating like these pasture lands as like a natural landscape. Um, yeah, we didn't know any better that that was all type converted, all that mustard and exotic grass, you know, was taken over, had taken over the native lands that used to be there. And, you know, all the shrubs and trees were relatively intact, but the other stuff was already gone. Yeah. And not realizing till decades later that, you know, most of California's grasslands and wildflowers were probably gone by the time of the Civil War. Yeah, that's, that's heavy knowledge. Yeah, right? Yeah. So, I, I can see why people resist, you know, learning about the world, but, you know, once you open that box. Yeah, you can't unsee it. <laughs> um, Carlos, can I ask you to introduce yourself? Good morning, uh, Nicole. Uh, my name is Carlos, uh, Carlos Flores. I'm originally from Guadalajara, Mexico. I grew up and um, uh, was raised there, went to architecture school. And a couple of years after uh, graduating, I moved to Los Angeles pursuing grad school in landscape architecture. Um, I got a job initially uh, as a drafts person. That's what I knew how to do is draw plans for, for uh, landscape designers. So I was working in the, the West Side with uh, pretty, very high-end residential garden designers um, doing really really great, great projects, very creative um, projects uh, where most of the time budget was not a, a constraint. So you could dream up and do anything you wanted. Um, it was really great, but um, that's also when I uh, woke up to my own privilege in um, uh, moving to this country with, with, with an education, with a college degree and many other forms of privilege that um, allowed me to have a job um, in the office uh, working, uh, you know, with garden designs and on a computer um, while other uh, people also from my country, my home country, working in the same company um, were uh, making a lot less money and working uh, much harder work, uh, labor out outside. Um, actually building building the gardens and installing um, the plants. So um, after that job, I, I did go into grad school. I studied grad, uh, landscape architecture at Cal Poly Pomona. Um, long story short, I finished grad school and I started working um, a little bit after in the federal government where I work now for the National Park Service. I'm an outdoor recreation planner. Uh, I also teach part-time at Cal Poly Pomona, and I am the current president of the American Society of Landscape Architects, uh, the Southern California chapter. Um, I am a native plant enthusiast uh, for a long time now, and uh, I'm a big fan of Theodore Payne Foundation, and I'm very happy to be here. Awesome. Thank you, Carlos. Um, Janet, can I ask you to introduce yourself? Yeah, hi everyone, happy Saturday. My name is Janet and I'm an organizer and member with East York Communities for Environmental Justice. Um, I grew up in Southeast Los Angeles in Huntington Park and that's um, on occupied territories of the Tongva people, one of the first um, caretakers and stewards of this land. And so for me, my entry point into my environment was my built environment. And so I remember organizing since high school um, around environmental justice issues. And, you know, growing up where we had like, like really strong odors, which I thought at that time it was coming from the Farmer John Slaughterhouse facility in Vernon, because I grew up two blocks away from that facility. Um, but becoming involved in, in organizing on environmental justice issues as a youth member, really gave me access points to understanding that these environments around me are not normal. Um, even though I grew up knowing that these 
and environments at first were normal, uh, which was seeing a lot of truck traffic, uh, the smells, the pollution, um, knowing that people in my family had asthma and that was something that I thought was just like inherited. It was just something that I thought got passed down. Um, but these are impacts of environmental health. These are impacts of uh, industrial pollution. And so um, through the organizing work, I did my undergrad at Cal State Northridge where I studied Chicano studies and sustainability. And I worked for the Forest Service here in the Angeles um, where I got to learn a little bit more about what theater paint is and, and the work that they do because that's how I would connect the public to a lot of the, the plants that they would see in the mountains. Um, and working with East Yard communities um, has allowed me to coordinate our decentralized community garden program um, where members have access to edible medicinal and native um, gardens as, as a way to address food apartheid, as a way to address environmental justice in our communities. And so I'm very humbled to be here and, and also part of my talk, I wanna honor um, the work of Barbara Drake and Julia Bogany who are Tongva elders who have passed in the last year. Um, and I, I owe them a lot um, for, for the work um, that they have instilled in me today. Thank you, Janet. Awesome. Um, so just to kind of center the conversation a little bit um, and maybe tie in with like the visionary perspectives of Los Angeles State Historic Park, um, I'd like to hear just briefly from each of you um, what you think constitutes a well-designed environment. Um, and if, if you guys want to go just in the same order, we can start with Andreas. And uh, just curious, and this can be at any scale. It can be at the, you know, the kind of intimate human scale of your personal garden, if you're lucky to have one. It could be at a regional scale. So whatever um, your experience speaks to you in that. Mm. Um, well, I guess, you know, a well-designed garden is something that fires on all the cylinders of um, aesthetics for me, of course, because that's one of my primary focuses, but, you know, native plants and the native, you know, the natural environment is naturally beautiful. It's, it plays off, anything that plays off of nature and works with the functions of nature. So, I mean, uh, yeah, well, that's a kind of a general answer, but yeah, sometimes when I'm hiking, you know, we just we have to pause and remark that like nature is the finest designer. Yeah, There's so many beautiful. I mean, and that's that's for me. That's always the touchstone. But um, you know, like the state historic park functions really well because it's got both. It's it's got you know the manicured spaces that allow people to you know gather outside and and you know, it's an extension of, of living rooms and kitchens and, you know, community spaces that you couldn't have without, you know, it's, it's a good use of grass, in other words. Yeah, that's a great but, point. But also, you know, introduces people to what the, what the other, the things that were here first. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Um, Carlos, I think with your work, sometimes you're looking at things maybe at a little bit broader scale since you're working with the National Park Service and you're thinking kind of maybe more on community scale. So I'm kind of curious for you um, what you think constitutes like a well-designed environment. Well, that's a, it's a great question. I, I, I could talk a lot um, about a well-designed environment. I think um, I want to sum it up as a uh, Speaking of, of urban gardens specifically, and urban green spaces, I would sum it up as a, an environment that provides more than it takes. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes I think uh, it's um, easier to do that and our work gets in the way of that. Uh, we, we design spaces and environments that, that take more than they give back. Uh, so I think a, a well-designed one is, is a garden that, um, provides the community, provides the neighborhood with uh, ecosystem services that don't just stay in the garden, but they, they expand, they extend out um, 
and connect with other gardens nearby, with the parks and with the other green spaces in the city. That's a wonderful philosophy. Thank you, Janet. Carlos, thank you. Yeah, Janet, what do you think? What do you think about this? Yeah, I come from a place where environments um, design is not really well done. Um, yeah. I don't know what in, like uh, urban planners were thinking at that time um, <laughs> to, to surround, you know, uh, residential homes with freeway entrances. And I'm not just talking about one freeway entrance. I'm talking about multiple, multiple um, freeways, um, excessive warehousing, excessive infrastructures. Um, for the goods movement um, and, and still think, you know, and still minimize um, the health impacts. And so when I think about, you know, environments or like access to land, you know, I think about um, where that memory stems from. And so for some of us, our first environment, right, was the womb. Um, and so for a lot of us, even in the womb, we were already um, being exposed to lead. We were already being exposed um, to contaminants. And so, you know, rethinking uh, and, and, you know, understanding our ecosystem and our environments go beyond just, you know, nature, really, they really go beyond um, the human experience. And so um, a, a place that's free of harm, uh, a place that is autonomous and sovereign, um, and a place that allows, you um, you know, for, for us to carry this like massive responsibility of rethinking what these relationships are to like humans and, and nature and, and, and plants and animals. Um, and, and yeah, I would just say that like, you know, where I grew up, it was just like, this didn't feel right, but I didn't have the words to say that, or I didn't feel empowered enough to say that. And so it wasn't, um, it wasn't until I, I was given access, right, given the resources as a young person to kind of bring that aha moment to myself of like, uh-huh, like um, asthma isn't normal or like, uh-huh, like breathing in diesel pollution isn't normal. Um, and so, yeah, um, ideally, right, we, we would like to push all our participants and, and push the work of theater pain to bring um, to the community more safety. Um, more opportunities to be free of harm. Um, and that's also going along with like ICE, um, police, um, because all those things really do impact um, how we all survive and thrive together. Yes, thank you for sharing those, those thoughts. Um, yeah, and there's, there's so much about the way that design um, influences uh, community outcomes. There's a lot of research going into that right now that's really fascinating. Um, I think, think that speaks to some of what you're saying as well. Um, so now that we kind of have a sense of where it would be, where we'd like to go with these ideas, um, I think it'd be really cool if we could talk about what people can do at different scales, right? So for people that are lucky enough to have a home garden, um, what sort of choices can they be making um, in order to, you know, get to this uh, better place with our relationship with the environment. And uh, I want to pose that question to Andreas, because I know the work that you do, Andreas, is um, you've done a lot of uh, wonderful work, really strong work with residential gardens, and you've been at it for a long time, and you have, a, I think, a really cool philosophy in the way that you approach your work. And I also love that you have a, a background in the arts, and that that informs your work as well. Um, so if you could talk a little bit about um, sort of the choices that you make as a designer at that scale, that would be really great. Um, I mean, in many ways, I don't approach the artwork I've been doing for the past 20 years any different than the garden, and they're intertwined. Um, it's for a long time been about the land use and, you know, how we use water in particular, but I mean, I guess the main thing is I feel like, you know, wherever I'm sitting or, you know, if it's someone else's garden, it's like, how much of this can we return to native habitat while still providing opportunities for growing food, for collecting water, for, you know, if you're wealthy enough and privileged enough, producing your own power, blah, 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 all that stuff, you know, that should be part of everybody's life and not just 
limited to, you know, forgive me, but the Tesla crowd and um, allowing, you know, the decentralization that was talked about last night to be something that happens everywhere. I mean, with climate change and all the problems, you know, caused by, you know, this corporate system that we live in, decentralization is the only solution. Everybody needs access to good food, clean air, clean water, you know, a healthy place to live. And for me, it's mostly about healing. And it's healing myself as well as trying to heal the environment that, you know, on some level I've helped destroy too. I mean, just participating in this stupid system. Yeah, and that takes us to more of like a regional scale, right? Because the design choices that are made at a regional scale impact all of our lives. We can't help but participate in them. And um, if we want to like really, you know, you can do what you can in your own home and that's valuable and important work. And, you know, working as you're saying too, just even with yourself is valuable and important work. Um, but then when you are part of a system that is, you know, counterproductive to these goals, that's incredibly challenging. And that's something that we, you know, as designers, um, we're like thinking about how can we shift this system? And um, I think actually a really helpful, um, I think Janet, you had a really helpful graphic that sort of demonstrates visually some of the issues that we're facing. And then um, I know some of the work that you're doing as an organizer really centers those issues and looks at ways that you can you can take action with your community. Um, so if you would be willing to share that graphic with our audience, I think that'd be really wonderful. Yes, thank you, Nicole. And also picking back off of what Andreas was saying, healing is very critical work um, to being invested into the environment. So I appreciate you sharing that, Andreas. Um, and so at this time, I'm going to share my screen. And so what you all have in front of you is a mapping tool. Um, it's an environmental justice mapping tool. And so this is the state of California. I'm just going to quickly put in the address to our East Yards office in Commerce, um, where you all can easily put your own office address, home address, school address, and, and this map allows you to kind of play with understanding the environment around you and the impacts of pollution in the area. And so this map takes into account the average of exposures and environmental effects. Um, so it takes into account about 20 combined indicators, which you see here, right? Which is ozone, particulate matter, which at first I was like, particulate matter, um, what is that? Um, it's just another way of saying, um, when you go outside to your car and you run your finger um, down your car and you pick up dust, um, that's particulate matter. And so when you're surrounded in an environment with multiple freeway entrances, right? Talking about right here, the 710 freeway is an artery that um, transports goods from the ports. And so this freeway on any given day um, has 40 to 60,000 um, diesel trucks moving up and down this freeway. And so you can already see right here that when, when we think about diesel exposure and contamination, um, there's a 97% um, exposure here. Um, so it looks at these contaminants, but then it also takes into account the average of sensitive populations. And so factors. And so, you know, what I had shared with you all, how myself at an early age, um, I had asthma, um, low birth rate is also an indicator of, you know, environmental health impacts and industrial pollution. Um, and so, you know, this is, is, this is not just a unique circumstance here in California. Um, you're talking about of the top polluted cities in the United States, um, six of them have populations that are 40% or more Latino. And then 66% of Latinos live in areas where the air is not even at federal standards, right? And so here's my community, which also falls under that. Um, and 
also, you know, contributing to this, we see the red, right? We see that the pollution burden here is 100%. And so even though we're looking at a map and we're just thinking of like, well, what is contributing to that? Um, in the in the last five, I would say five years, but in reality, it's been a 30 year fight. Um, we've been dealing with a lead battery recycling plant, um, XI Technologies. Um, they're, they were notorious for contaminating the community um, by spewing uh, seven, 7 million tons of lead, 7 million pounds, 7 million pounds of lead in the community, right? And so I talked about womb ecology. And so what are the effects on the environment, especially um, for developing babies, right? At an early age being exposed to these contaminants. And so the egg side facility right now is, is undergoing uh, California, one of California's largest cleanup. It's also one of the costliest cleanup um, for 10,000 residential homes. Um, and so this, is, this map really shows you where environmental racism is, which environmental racism is a product of redlining. It's a product of segregation, right? Um, and it shows you um, the injustices here and how there's a lot of work to be done in these communities to help people, help nature better redefine itself to, um, to being a, a, a place that's free of, of harm, free of pollution. Um, so let, I'll go ahead and stop sharing screen. Thank you so um, much for sharing that, Janet. Thank you. Can I ask Janet, those 10,000 yeah. homes, Hello. Yeah. Ten thousand residential homes. Yes. Right. So, so what does that cleanup actually mean? What is what's happening? So, what it actually means is that there is an agency that's overseeing this cleanup, and that agency is the Department of Toxic and Substances Control. Um, we had to advocate very hard um, for this money. Um, it's actually borrowed money, and so Jerry Brown actually gave money to the cleanup, but it borrowed it from California. So Exide was not even responsible for any of the cleanup. Um, and right now, the what members, what community members are having to go through is that the Department of Toxic and Substances Control um, is not doing block by block, it's doing home by home. And so they take the soil um, from wow. their resident from their residential properties and then it replaces them with new soil so and they're so, actually excavating the soil yeah and so if you're thinking about having a garden if you're thinking about um, eating you know the the edible foods that you're producing in right. your home you know what are the contributors to your health if you're consuming the food or if you're consuming the plants that you're growing um, so in a time when Michelle Bo Michelle Obama was saying, grow your own food, grow a garden, right? right? right. We were just like, where, how? <laughs> and um, the, right. the agencies have put a cleanup standard of 80 parts per million, um, but the California agriculture lead standard was 5.6 parts per million, oh. right? And so there's discrepancies, at least from, from me, right? As, as an urban um, agriculture advocate, um, for these agencies to rethink their cleanup standards. Um, and right now we're trying to push that barrier of a 1.7 mile radius to a four point, maybe a five mile radius because the agencies haven't found or sampled enough to see where, it, where the contamination ends, right? Right. Wow. That's gonna take generations. Yeah. So this is, one really powerful example of a horrible environmental disaster that entire communities are vastly affected by. And when we're talking about these things before, I think um, Evan used the analogy of rebuilding a plane while we're flying in it, right? Because we have this massive entangled infrastructure and all these communities that are being um, detrimentally affected by you know, all these toxic outcomes. And um, this is a, a huge challenge for, for people in, you know, community planning, design. And I'm, I'm kind of curious, um, Carlos, like with your experience, um, 
what sort of um, strategies can be employed to help mitigate some of these issues? I mean, we talked about straight up excavating soil, um, but what are some of the other, like if we kind of take a step back and look at, you know, this area of say the Northeast Los Angeles and um, looking at all the, like the freeways, the industry, um, what are some of the things that we can be doing on like a locally regional scale to help mitigate those issues? Yeah, that is a big uh, question. It's a pretty complicated problem. And um, I do wanna keep the focus though on the, on the injustices that Janet brought up. Um, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a topic that we cannot ignore. Um, and it's a, in many ways, it's a, it's a systemic problem. It's a systemic problem and design solutions are only going to address the symptoms of that problem. So we can address immediate uh, local site scale uh, issues and um, scale them up a little bit, but we're not going to address the problem itself. And this panel is probably um, not, not a, we don't have enough time to get deep into a, um, a thorough conversation of, of those, the systemic side of those problems. Um, but I think that uh, um, what Janet brings up is, is really worth considering. I think uh, having a garden, having any type of garden is a, is a privilege that some of us enjoy. Some of us don't enjoy that. But having lead in your soil is, is an injustice, right? We, we should not be suffering that injustice. And the fact that some people are suffering that injustice, that, that points us to those, you know, what decisions, what policy was put in place that caused that, this to happen? And if that is still in place, it's going to continue to happen in the future. So um, uh, going back to your question about the design solutions, I think those can, can help us um, address the symptoms and provide some short-term solutions and mitigate some of the, some of the uh, impacts of that, of that systemic problem. Um, and I think we, we need to think, you used the word scale um, earlier, and, and I like that word because that's, the, uh, that's a word landscape architects work with. We, we think in terms of scale, uh, and um, it's also tied to ecology, right? So in ecology, the lowest scale is, is an organism, so one plant, for example. Um, one scale up is a, a, a population, a population of plants, say all the, the shrubs in your garden of the same species. Um, scale that up a little more and it's a community. Uh, so maybe you have a, a native garden and your neighbor has one. So, you know, together they start forming a community, an urban community. And the next scale up is the ecosystem, the urban ecosystem. And I think that is where we, can use plants, native plants, as part of the solution, not the only one, but part of an important part of the design solution. Um, using native plants, we can uh, start distributing the ecosystem benefits in a, in a more fair uh, manner across the city. And I think that is what people at home can do. Uh, you know, many people in this audience, I'm sure, are familiar with native gardens, that's why they're here. Um, and I'm sure, you know, once you have your native garden at home, that is great. That is great. But think, you know, scale it up. Think about what is, what is um, outside of your garden, where your pollinators are coming from, where your birds are going after they visit your garden. So think of the urban ecosystem. And this is one way of, uh, of extending those benefits slowly, but, uh, but steadily um, across the, the Across the city, and uh, and for you know sites that are heavily contaminated, those those are going to it's going to be very expensive. It's going to require a lot of work, but there are organizations out there doing this work, and um, and not just the physical the design work. I do want to um, call attention to um, well the Jan the, the 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 organization Janet represents um, is is one of them. It's doing great work. Just in calling attention to the problem, that's that's really uh, huge already. Um, we have some organizations. I'd like to um, uh, just give a shout out to, uh, um, for example, um, LA Neighborhood Land Trust is an organization that works in some of these areas. 
and they develop design solutions wherever they find the opportunity, even, even in these contaminated sites, uh, very um, it's developed places. Um, they find opportunities in alleys. They find opportunities to build small pocket parks here and there, um, schoolyards, and you know, asphalt playgrounds are transformed into little islands of uh, biodiversity. And together, these are the things that scale up those benefits across the city. Um, so um, LA, I mentioned LA Neighborhood Land Trust, um, Green Schoolyards of America is another one that's doing really great work, uh, transforming those asphalt playgrounds into, into, uh, into native gardens uh, and green infrastructure. Um, the Trust for Public Land, uh, Northeast Trees, there's, there's numerous uh, organizations. So once you have that native garden at home, you know, continue to care for it, but look out, look beyond and support some of these organizations that, um, that do, yes, they do use native plants as part of their, as part of their arsenal, but um, they do uh, so much more uh, beyond um, uh, you know, one, one site scale intervention. Awesome, thank you, Carlos. And thank you for sharing um, some of those other organizations. Um, since we do have Janet here with us, I would love to hear a little bit more about um, the work that you do advocating like on a community level. Um, I know one of the one of my my friends, Karina, um, is also involved with East Yards, and she was telling me a little bit about a project you guys are, are working on that sounds really powerful called Green Yard or sorry, uh, Green Zones. And um, I would love to hear more about that from you. Yeah, thank you for that question. And, and shout out to Karina, who was one of the first people that I had attended the native plant garden tour with Theater Pain with. And she also introduced me to your nursery, which is um, very close to home now. Um, so yeah, one of the many policy um, uh, ways that we're being involved is through the green zones and so green zones is a county-wide initiative to really develop land use strategies that address public health measures and like quality of life for residents um so you know thinking of those um, communities that have been historically impacted by industrial pollution um or um poor land use or poor um, municipal zoning codes for example um so we do this by advocating that the county looks into like the screening tool that you all saw with the map, right? To kind of get an idea of where to get started. Um, look at already ex zoning, uh, existing zoning requirements. And uh, one of the key things that we were involved in in 2018 was ground truthing. Um, so these, this idea of ground truthing is that- That's Janet, uh, she's like the new board member. Oh, hold on, I think. Liz, you need to mute yourself. <laughs> Liz, you're um, not muted. Sorry yeah, about that, guys. Uh, you're cool, you're cool. Um, so ground truthing in 2018 um, was really a way for residents to get involved in some of the planning efforts that the county was doing because the county might have permits and businesses on their maps or papers or whatever, but it, that doesn't really reflect what's on the ground, right? It doesn't really reflect like how some businesses might have closed, some businesses might have other operations going on that even the county is not aware of. And so with that program, we were able to engage like um, 115 residents that um, put together seven events and really identified 8,000 addresses. Um, but in doing this work, we're also noticing that we have an overwhelming presence of outer repair shops, overwhelming presence of, you know, metal scrapping facilities um, and, and warehouses. And I think where, where we have a, a very difficult time is that agencies and, and government um, uh, offices and departments often tell, the, tell us that there will be a phasing, a time a time frame for phasing um, out some of these like um, issues in our communities, right? And so they tell us, well, in five years, in ten years, and it's just like we can't wait that long. 
why do we need to wait such a long time to ensure that our health is being prioritized, right? Why do we have to wait such a long time for designers and urban planners to suddenly know that we need trees to buffer these freeways, right? When Glendale has been having these all along, um, when there's other communities that have been having trees all along. Um, and so for us, it's really about um, bringing community to the center of these conversations um, and identifying, you know, what is stakeholder engagement that we need to address um, these overwhelming presence of, of industry in our communities. And so, yes, there's sensitive uses, right? Um, but sometimes we know that air travels and it travels far. And so even though we could set like a 500 feet or five mile, you know, it's, it's that these um, industries have long-term effects, not just to health, but also to climate change. Um, and so how are we going to advocate that agencies and industries move a lot quicker to phase out the use of chemicals, right? Phase out the use. And so I'm looking at all my, my Amazon Prime members right now. I'm looking at all my, um, um, what is it? Same day delivery people, right? Is that um, when you take part in, in, in consuming products that allow for infrastructures like the rail yards, like the freeways, like these warehouses, to build and make um, uh, the best way that I can say this is just like you don't know, you don't see um, the the shit that we have to deal with because you want to have your your textbook the next day because you want to have your your goods um, quicker and and more efficient right and cheaper um, and so as we see. Um, more people speaking truth to power in our communities and, and in spaces like these. It's really about how do we as consumers start to develop practices that are anti-capitalist because clearly these freeways are not gonna go anywhere. Clearly these rail yards are not going anywhere. And so how do we push them to shift in ways that are maybe electric, but even there's problems there. Um, and so really looking at what sustainability means through the lens of environmental justice and also indigenous justice as well. Thank you so much, Janet and Carlos and Andreas. This has been a really awesome conversation. I appreciate you guys taking the time to talk with us today. And thank you, Evan, for inviting all of us to be here. We really appreciate it. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Thank you, Nicole. Thank you, Carlos, Janet, Andreas. That was a really uh, meaningful and deep conversation and one that is really important for us to have and to just acknowledge things um, as they are and be realistic about the world. I love the point that Carlos made about if you have the privilege of having a garden, once you've got it kind of in a good place, it doesn't stop there. There are so many other ways to continue to build nature, build diversity, for the community that can go outside of your little piece of land and, and bring it to others. And community spaces are such an important aspect um, of, of this whole equation that we've been discussing. So many, many thanks to all of you. Um, uh, I, I would ask the to this conversation to continue in the chat. And if Janet and Andreas and Carlos can kind of just keep, uh, you know, put some links in, just help help people find resources that you're discussing. Um, I really appreciate that. And thank you so much for going on. We're going to keep moving here um, and, and look to, to another beautiful garden for inspiration. So Erin, um, where are we headed next? All right. So now we are headed to West Hollywood. Um, and we have uh, today a home uh, that has been working with a really amazing studio called Studio Petrichor. And so we have um, Sean Mastretti and Lee Adams from Studio Petrichor here um, to talk about the garden and their process and the really interesting experimental work and research that they're doing, um, as well as the homeowners, Robert Harrison and Ken McFarland. Uh, thank you guys both so much for being here today. Um, and I think we also have, um, uh, Max Cantor from Saturate California. Um, if he's Max, not hopping on today, he's going to be in a uh, panel discussion tomorrow. But he, his um, Saturate California is the one who um, takes care of this this landscape. So welcome everyone. 
Thanks for having us. Thrilled to be here. Very nice. It's great I to have you guys. <laughs> <laughs> Max will be on tomorrow. Um, he's not able to join us today, but I'm going to hit play. We'll watch a little promo video to get us kind of inspired. Then we're going to talk about this garden. So thank you, everybody, for being here um, on, on a Saturday. We, we appreciate our audience listening in. And we've got um, well over 200 people watching live. And many more, I think, will be watching this sometime in the future. So hello from the past. <laughs> Start the video. I just say that shot, that panning shot of all the shots we've done throughout this whole project, that panning shot where it goes across that LA and you see the red buds in the winter into spring probably captures what we wanted to do with this tour the most. That's such a beautiful <laughs> um, I just yeah, want to start there. To catch it in summer too because it's it's gorgeous. Doubly spectacular. We'll be back. We'll be back. Don't yeah. worry. We are coming back. Um, so we're going to just kind of zoom in on the house here, but I guess before we get going um, into the actual property, maybe Sean and Lee kind of describe the um, the overarching process. Because I know that we were just talking about environmental, you know, what, how can you think about the environment, incorporate that into a specific project? I think this project encapsulates that quite well. So I wonder if you could just give a quick, quick overview so that people know what they're going to see in terms of the environmental kind of conceptual part of this project. Sure, sure, thanks for asking. Um, uh, one of our starting processes um, in the design process is really listening and observing, understanding the site, uh, most importantly, understanding the soil. And um, I knew when I walked up to this house and saw that pink and purple house that I had to land these clients. I just love the color of that house. And there's just so much charm uh, on that site and so much uh, spirit in the site. <clears throat> so we employed, um, or we, we looked at historical colonial revival gardens because uh, it felt appropriate to uh, honor that, honor this garden and experiment, really, this was an experiment in can we do a formal formally organized yet loose, natural and wild garden um, in this manner. And I believe that we succeeded and uh, we all learn every single year. Uh, and I do wanna preface this by saying that that soil, um, though we thought it was wonderfully easy to get into, um, it ended up being pretty tricky because it's really well drained alluvium. And historically, Robert and Ken can talk about this. Historically, this was agriculture. Uh, uh, for Nepalis and tomatoes. So there is a high amount of micronutrients and uh, salinity in the soil, which uh, created some stress for some plants, but we can move forward now. And please do ask questions. We definitely planted a couple of succession Engelman oaks in the front. We're super excited about that. I love talking about plants, so I'm going to talk about plants as we go along, but feel free to ask questions. Um, Engelman oak, I will just say, is one of my favorite oaks. It's a rare Southern California Pause oak. it for a second. Just for, oh. sorry. Landing on the red buckwheat. Yeah, I wanted to note that when I came up to the property and saw this, this giant plant growing on one of the berms, which we're gonna talk about in a minute, I thought someone had gone in and planted an Artemisia and that was a giant California poppy. <laughs> wow. <laughs> There's the red bud in winter. Mm -hmm. Actually, this shot pans to something really interesting. I'm gonna pause it halfway. Mm. Okay, we're, oh, I just missed it. But we, we were seeing two sides of a path there. Yeah. 
what can you talk a little bit about the plants on the left and the plants on the right and how how you kind of interplay that so our clients love roses and so we wanted to create the front garden so that it was you know there was a curb appeal to it there was a sense of order um yet wild uh we were kind of framing the chaos if you will uh the majority of the parterre hedges are ramnus or frangula mound san bruno which is a coffee berry variety and on that other side on the left side we framed it with boxwood that's the one hydrozone where we have some roses and we have wild uh david austin roses and we let that rose garden get completely out of control and it has the most wonderful charm to it um, so that's what's on that side of the pathway and the rest of it is framed with mount san bruno coffee berry there were some areas that the coffee berry did not take and what we have done at, uh, is infilled with what is working really well and that is the red buckwheat the island Areogonum grande rubescence and uh, that is a showstopper in the front in June and July. Um, so, and it has found its way to reseeding throughout the area. Excellent. So, so we're using that kind of formal, um, yeah. uh, more ornamental kind of palette on one side of the path. And you can see that in the distance of this shot, the path is, is towards the top of the, of the camera view. And then, the, and then in the foreground, you're seeing kind of the native representation of that style. And we'll see a lot of that popping up as this formal yeah. design use with uh, native plants, biodiversity, and environmental sustainability, which is a totally doable thing. And often we hear that that's not possible, but it is, and this garden shows you that it is. It's not only possible, it is great fun and deeply satisfying. It really is an experiment. And this front garden started off with a lot of coral bells and they didn't like it. They didn't like it. But what we lit, we listened to that. We learned from that, and we saw what really did. We wanted to keep our plant palette simple. Simple. There's Berberus repens, the creeping barberry, one of our go-to plants, and um, the Areogonum grande rubescens, the Mount San Bruno coffee berry, uh, the leatherleaf coffee berry on the back berm uh, is doing spectacularly. That's a great foundational background plant. The front has four planters. One of them got eaten by a squirrel, but there's four Dudleya Bretonii's with the uh, Arctostaphylos Burt Johnson. It's an Edmundsii, that one right there. Uh, you know, these aren't meant to last forever, but I just thought, how beautiful is that creeping over the edge of a pot? Um, and it's been in there, those, those have been in that pot for about three years. I just want to freeze frame on this hummingbird for a second on this yeah. water feature. I know water plays a big role in this garden. All of the fountains that you'll see are constructed of, of broken and repurposed materials. And what I want you to note here is all of the materials that you see, most of the materials you see are repurposed and salvaged. The flagstone, the brick, the tables that you're about to see are made from the liquid amber trees that we uh, had taken down in the front that were um, suffering from xylella. Um, and of course, the wood and green waste uh, went into the hugel culture, which we'll talk about. This hedge is Mirica Californica. I believe it has a new name now. That's the Pacific Wax Myrtle. It's a beautiful, beautiful hedge. And it has a wonderful fragrance when you rub up against it. Yeah, that's an, under, an unsung hero. I think, I think that should be utilized more. I see it working more, uh, I see it working better in coastal or you know, where there's more coastal influence than it is inland. Um, there's Carex Panza lining the edge of the pathway with that repurposed uh, flagstone. The flagstone that we started off with was just this curvaceous pathway and patio that we saw cut and created this beautiful grid pattern that you see here and was able to keep all of that material on site. And here's the liquid amber tree. And this was a real gift you want to talk about that? Yes, Ken and Robert's nephew um, took that wood. They had it milled on site. And then he took that wood and made this beautiful furniture that is a legacy piece. It speaks to the history of the property and the future of Ken and Robert there entertaining in that garden on wood furniture that came from their own site. It's really rewarding. And he added purple to yeah, it, yes, which did. made it even more exciting. 
Got to get the purple. <gasps> Got to get the purple. Um, I will just give a shout out for an, a, a, a really cool company called Angel City Lumber that if, if you have a tree on your property that's coming down and you want to turn it into something, they will come and, and help you do that. And, and this is just a really nice way to keep something from going, you know, you honor the, the tree that you have lost. So if a tree dies, you can, you can do something like this. And it has these layers of meaning, uh, sustainability, environmentalism, but also just a connection to, to your space. And something really important is that when trees have to come down, as these trees did have to come down due to xylella, if you take them down before you get into the end stages and the wood is compromised, you have beautiful hardwood to use and cherish for a lifetime. Absolutely. Um, we're, we're looking at this kind of formal um, backyard here with all California native plants. We're, we're in the winter landscape now. So we're seeing tree, deciduous trees and we're also seeing the early growth of annuals. So yeah, um, playing off of that colonial re revival design, there's the alley of trees, there's the parterres, there's the axial pathways, um, a lot of classic features that you see that came from Europe. Um, and uh, so we could not find the native Circus occidentalis in the standard form at the time. So we went ahead with the, the Oklahoma variety of canadensis. And uh, as you will see in the spring garden, it's just very showy. And in the summer garden, it just creates this beautiful canopy of those heart-shaped leaves. This is the open meadow um, that we've been playing with. We just planted some Balea multiradiata. That's the desert marigold, which blooms year round. The meadow consists of Carex panza, Budalua gracilis blonde ambition. That's the blue grandma. There's a few Sporobulus aero Aerodryoides, something like that, <laughs> um, which is also known as Alkali Sacaton, another strange name, um, and annuals, of course. This berm you see here in the back, we had three Herstorium, uh, Cianothus Herstorium, and two of them, because they were getting overwatered, they of course died from Phytophthora. Uh, this one has taken over the berm and is covering up the Lysingia, which is really exciting. And it bloomed, it just, you'll see some blooms on it. And if you haven't smelt this plant, it smells like chocolate. You have yes. to rub your hands on it. And the clients, uh, Robert and Ken said, get us that chocolate shrub. We want that chocolate <laughs> shrub. <laughs> so can you talk a little bit about the Hugo culture? And we, we saw early on uh, a minute ago, a big pile of debris. And so that's what's underneath. Sure. The berms. But can you pause you it for a second right on this berm? Sure. Go ahead. So uh, Hugel culture is mound culture in German, and it's a construct we use uh, both to increase the fertility of our soil, increase our planting space, help to design and embrace around our clients' gardens, and to passively and actively harvest and optimize our water use. Uh, one of the best things that it does for us besides sequestering carbon is that it gives us an opportunity to use the green waste from on site, any tree material that's coming down and to put that back into the ground that we're taking it from. It's our gift back to the soil. And as we experiment with this, um, it has more and more opportunities uh, we now know how to in inoculate logs with uh, mushroom spores so we can do bioremediation at the same time as we're increasing healthy soil yeah. uh, and planting opportunities. And my underlying, uh, my, I'm all about waste transformation and keeping out of the landfill and out of the waste stream. And uh, there's a Ribes sanguineum uh, Claremont. Uh, mine at home is doing really well. And these are both poor soil conditions. Uh, it, it loves it. That's Aristolochia californica, the Dutchman's pipe vine. Beautiful plant. In, in a pipe dream to bring down the pipe vine swallowtail. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this one is a vine. Um, look at that crazy flower. And it, it has a mutualist relationship with a special type of butterfly, which Sean just mentioned. Mm -hmm. Endangered. Yeah. Endangered, yep. And this, we... Typically, we'll have this at TPF um, in the nursery for sale. Keep moving forward here. So that was blooming in winter, huh, Aaron? 
Yep. Yep. So that fountain and continue uh, to the spring. That fountain is made up of all of the broken concrete from the front. Uh, and we worked with a, a shout out here for Angie Wiley. Uh, I believe it's West Coast Fountains. Forgive me if I got it wrong. Angie Wiley and her team helped us create this beautiful pond. And now Robert and Ken want more native plants in that pond. So I have to search high, uh, far and wide. Um, in the promo video that you'll see on the website, Robert talked about the history of the Nopales. So we uh, planted the uh, uh, Puntia basilaris, um, two of them on the berm. And in that pond, Robert has pet fish that come up to be touched and petted when they're fed. It's a delightful addition. Bud break is one of the greatest things of early, very early spring, late winter. I remember we shot um, this property in January, just, just as things were, were peeking through. And the spring was actually shot on the first day of spring. Here we go. So look at that shift there. So beautiful. One thing about this garden that is constant is the change. The change is constant throughout this, throughout the year. And um, it was so exciting to try and uh, test this on, you know, clients that may have not been ready for it and they I, I think they love it do you love it <laughs> <laughs> we're out here in the backyard enjoying everything <laughs> just uh just so everyone knows when you have regular plants you know that you get from regular nurseries you don't have seasons they all stay the same all year round that's not the case here with uh nat native plants you really get to see the seasons. there's that uh Herstorium cyanothus in bloom, yes. and the the Lysingia, they change the Corthrogeny, they change the name, they always do that on us. Once you get to know the name. <laughs> and notice the soft rise that the, cre the hugel creates there, so that we have a mounding uh, habit of the plant over a mound, and it gives that soft and gentle surround. Yeah, and some of that negative space that you see right now is giving rise to other things like the Aquilegia eximia, which is an unusual columbine growing right there. And um, yeah, all of this material was able to be repurposed uh, and, and reused and more permeable. Um, <clears throat> and uh, let's see here. Yeah, the, the, most of the plants in the pond are native and they, they're going through their season as well. The Mimulus guttatus, which is not showing off right now with that yellow flowering monkey flower, um, it just, it has creeped through all of the cr cracks and crevices on that fountain. Um, that plant you just saw was a strawberry tree, which is closely related to manzanita. And we, we need to cre create some screening along that side of the property. And we included that, we've, we've included some non-native plants throughout this whole time and the things that work really well with a native palette. So Arbutus unido, the strawberry tree is very similar um, water requirements to, to our native plants. So it's a good, good choice if you're looking for a very specific function there. One of the things that Studio Petrichor is looking to truly understand and test is plant community based design. And we want to test these plant communities, whether it's a non-native or a native, you know, community blended together. Um, <clears throat> will they survive and persist through our, our extreme droughts with minimal supplemental water? And now that this garden is in its third year, Max Cantor of Saturate, who maintains this garden, um, is pushing the boundaries. Just to note that Cianothus is Concha, one of the most spectacular blues out there. And that uh, Salvia is Pinky, which isn't blue, blooming right now. That's Leucophila Pinky, a uh, really neat uh, variety that's available and on display at Theodore Payne Foundation. One of the things that you can't tell from this video is the amount of wildlife that's present. If you could hear the sounds of the birds and the buzzing of the insects, it's it's so refreshing. There's the song of the water in the background, but the birds, the chirping squirrels, and the, the buzzing of insects is always present. Yeah. Especially since this is right on Hollywood Boulevard. We said, yes. we mentioned it's West Hollywood, but this is street 
level with Hollywood Boulevard and the birds back there. I wish we did have the birds over this footage because it was incredible. Yeah, that morning we were shooting our interview. Uh, as soon as the sun came out, we noticed all of the birds were moving in and um, it was quite a sight. And Robert and Ken get to experience this on a daily basis. I get to visit every once in a while. <laughs> Clarkia and Wikilana. Yeah. Um, the one thing I love about the negative space in the meadow, um, there's a cool season grass, which is the Carex panza, and the warm season grass, which is the uh, blue grandma. So the blue grandma hasn't uh, come out yet, but in the summertime, it is full. And that's what I'm hoping to see. Uh, we want to see a lot of is the blue grandma and the balia, the desert marigold together uh, throughout the summer. You can see some of the coral bells that did make it. Um, they weren't crazy about what was going on in the soil there, uh, but the Berberus repens is um, <clears throat> very happy. The coral bells um, in mass is so beautiful. It, it's that giant poppy. There's that giant poppy. There's that giant poppy on the front. I know, but I couldn't oh. believe. <laughs> That's that a Google poppy. Yeah. <laughs> I have to say that, KP, pause it for just a second. The Carpinteria, we lost one Carpinteria, and it was the one that had a double flower. Oh, Carol, no. Bor Carol Bornstein sent it over to uh, uh, Bart O'Brien and said, look at this. And he said, well, if it comes back again, if it's consistent, get a cutting. You know, But uh, for some reason, that's the one that died. So and I hope that we get a, a, some more this year. This is the challenge of a, of a video-based garden tour. You can see just the buds here. So we just missed this. Carpinteria bursting into bloom, but that just means you'll have to come back and see it in person if we ever. Oh, we're going to have a garden party. <laughs> okay. It's going to happen. Robert. <laughs> right, Robert? Okay. Yeah, maybe we should ask Robert if that's okay first. Yeah. <laughs> He's ready. We're there. coming over. <laughs> But look how beautiful those buds are. I mean, it, it doesn't have to be all about flowers. There's beauty. I bet they're in bloom right now, right? Are they in bloom right now, Robert? Yeah. You know, you talked about negative spaces. There aren't any negative spaces now. Oh, cool. Yay. Party time. Uh, one of the things that we did that was uh, daring and unusual, and it's probably not in this video. You might see it in the promo, but we planted Garia Beachii mm. and Rus Lentii at the front at the street to create a, a wonderful hedge, but we tested different plants and a few of the garyas made it and are thriving. So we're infilling with the Rus lentii because that does well in some partial shade too. You can see in the background, the leather leaf coffee berry on that berm is just dense, really dense and very happy. There's that Dudleya just, just starting to bloom. And that, that Dudleya manzanita combo in the pot is really special. That was one of the neatest pots we, we saw. Um, beautiful. And we can only imagine in the summertime with this um, buckwheat up front here. Yeah. That must be just totally gorgeous. I couldn't believe the first year. They were two to three feet tall, those flowers. And there's some photos um, on the website of that. There's the Mount San Bruno. You can see the the, uh, and there's the leather leaf right there. Robert to the, wants to tell us about the red buckwheat. The red buckwheat. All I was just going to say is this is one of the things that the, oops, I know that didn't work very well. Let me do it over here. Oh, we're, we can hear you. We can hear you, yeah. Uh, I guess I unmuted. Anyway, technology. <laughs> the, uh, the bees love the buckwheats in the front. So you see all the different kinds of bees here. Yeah. And actually, I didn't talk about that earlier. I have seen at least eight different varieties of bees here, things that I've never seen anywhere else. The one bee with a, a, a shiny carapace that is bronze colored and huge. I've never seen that before. So I, you all probably have seen them, I haven't. We're gonna that, have to get you to start using iNaturalist yes. and do a bio blitz at your house. Okay, very good. Well, that's the next step, all right. Yeah, and this, this is a theme we've been hitting repeatedly. We're gonna see it on, on many of the gardens that this extra layer of life that comes and the, the beauty and joy in that and seeing this new crazy looking insect and saying, I created a home for that. 
I mean, that's just a whole nother layer of beauty that you can add with these gardens. There's more than 1,600 bee species native to the state of California. So it's just, we always, you know, talk about and think about the honeybee when you're listening to the media. And, and then when you plant these plants and start seeing these other bees come in, it's just, it's amazing. That's so cool. The Budalua gracilis of uh, the blooming head in, in the early summer, um, there's a couple of months period where the longhorn bees, if you are up before seven o'clock, you see them clustered on the head, sound asleep, you can pet them. And it's one of the most gratifying things to think that you provided an overnight hangout for a bunch of bees. <laughs> yeah. There's some Rus ovata in the background. It's going to take a while before that gets big. Um, there's the Cianoth concha, Cianothus concha up in the front again. And, and that's on the edge of the rain garden. No, uh, it's behind the berm. Behind, but we haven't mentioned the rain garden. Mm -hmm. which is... um, so Lee brought up a really good point. One of the one of the main features that you kind of we didn't focus on was the uh, rainwater harvesting. So we did all of the calculations to make sure we could harvest as much of that water on site. And uh, next to all of the berms is a rain garden where we harvest that, uh, all of that water. And that water does not ever overflow and have to leave the property because the soil is so well drained, it all stays. And there's a couple questions in here. Someone's asking about plant lists. If you email me, and I'm gonna put our stuff in, our, our information in here again. If you email me, I will send you a Google link uh, to, oops, yeah, let's see here. Did I do it? Okay, I'll send you a Google link to the plant list and there might even be a, a pictorial version of that that might not be completely updated, but it's pretty thorough. And we also have a plant list from last year, you guys were on the garden tour as well. And that uh, page is still up on the, on the website if you wanna pull that plant list too. Great, I just wanna do a quick thank you. I wanna thank the squirrels and the wildlife, including Robert and Ken's dogs for teaching us mm -hmm. what you're hungry for, AKA manzanitas and where you need to rest in the garden. Um, there's something magical that happens when you realize that the garden was never really meant for us, that we are privileged to be a part of it and nature is in control and we get to support. Uh, our contractor, Aero Sprinkler, you are our rock. Angie Riley, you're a gem. Jason Wan of Hunter Industries for our irrigation and FX luminaire lighting. You're, you're a gem as well. Phil and Sons Tree Service and, um, Robert, and Son, Robert and Ken's nephew for doing those benches. And of course, Max and the Saturate team for nurturing this garden. We're so grateful to you. You guys are doing amazing work. Most importantly, Robert and Ken, thank you Robert for trusting us to be bold and learn with you during this process. We are truly grateful. Thank you. We it. Robert you. and Ken, thank you for opening your home to us. Sean and Lee and Max and the whole uh, team. It's a beautiful space and it shows you that you can have a lot of kind of intersecting things. You can have formal design, you can have biodiversity, you can have sustainability. Um, they, all, they all can go hand in hand and create a beautiful space. So with that, we're gonna keep moving here. Um, thank you. Thank you guys for coming out. Thanks guys. It's California Native Plant Week this week. I don't think we've mentioned that yet, which is <laughs> kind of embarrassing that we forgot to do that. But this is a big week for us California Native Plant Nerds. And I am super excited to have a good friend of mine and someone who I think understands what we've been through because he's done the same thing himself. Um, what, a, what a kind of huge feat it is to pull off this type of um, online garden experience. And that is David Bryant of California Native Plant Society. Hi, David. Hey, Evan. How's Welcome. It Thank you. You know, you probably forgot it was Native Plant Week because for us, it's always Native Plant Week. <laughs> you're, you're exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, so if you don't know California Native Plant Society, David, can you just give a quick overview so people can, can connect with you guys and learn about what you're doing? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And thanks for the introduction. So we are the California Native Plant Society and we are a statewide organization and have 35 chapters all across the state, including down in Baja, which is, is really fabulous. And I can't recommend connecting with your chapter enough. And so around the orbit of, of Theodore Payne, we have 
the LA Santa Monica Mountains, the San Gabriel uh, Mountains, Riverside, San Bernardino, Orange County, South Coast, San Diego, so many chapters. So wherever you are, there is a chapter for you. And there are uh, tremendous amounts of volunteer opportunities from plant sales to invasive plant removal. There's community gatherings monthly with a uh, theme speaker series. So CNPS is uh, just a wonderful community of native plant lovers, scientists, culture keepers, horticulturalists. Um, and Theodore Payne is such a fabulous partner in, in that endeavor. And we're so honored to be part of the Native Garden Tour today. So yeah, thank you. we're happy to have you. And, and um, I've been connected with CNPS for, for a long time, a lot of friends there. It's a wonderful organization. They do advocacy, they preserve, places like that beautiful uh, wildflower area behind you. They help, they help make sure that nature out there stays, stays out there and doesn't get turned into uh, developments. So they, they do have big advocacy, they have research. And also I think what's really cool is they are partners with us in bringing nature into urban California. And part of that happens through events like we're having today, which um, show people what can be done and, and how how we can do it on many different levels, many different types of ways. So having that model, um, you're getting a lot of garden tour content from Theodore Payne this weekend, but I'm happy to say it's not gonna end this weekend. So David, what what uh, can the viewers have in store for the rest of the week after our garden tour ends this weekend? Yeah, so I'm gonna keep you in suspense for, for just a few minutes as I tease up what we're going to introduce, but for Native Plant Week, uh, we have launched a 360 garden tour campaign. And so you can jump into these 360 experiences and navigate through them um, as if you were there, uh, the next best thing. And so you can click on interpretive tags, uh, plant labels and other content as you navigate through these, through these experiences. And the vision behind this was to provide Californians in our community with a perennial source of inspiration and also a way to see native plants um, at scale in conjunction with other species and in the, all the infinite ways of design that you can incorporate native plants into your yard. So when you're looking at say deer grass or toyon or you know, any number of our thousands of native plant species, you can hop into these 360 garden experiences and see them in context like, like you've been able to do so beautifully in the garden tours uh, today. So, um, I will go ahead and share my screen if that's possible. Let's see. Beautiful. Oh, that works so great. So it, all you have to do is you go to cnps.org and that will take you to our homepage. And right on there is this big teaser for our California Native Plant Week campaign, which is Grow Care Everywhere. And you click right on that and that will take you to the landing page where we have all of our uh, garden tours. And so I, I wanna give a brief synopsis of the, the campaign. Um, we really wanna express with Grow Care Everywhere that uh, connecting with California native plants is for everyone. And there's, no, there's just an infinite number of ways to do that in our gardens, um, our wildlands, in our communities, in the built environment. As you're seeing through all these uh, really diverse tours that, that the Theodore Payne Foundation is putting on, which is so fabulous because there's just no one way to do native gardening. Um, and so as you go down through the tour lineup, uh, we're going to be releasing tours every day. Uh, we are really excited to show you Bruce Schwartz's garden, who you'll also get the chance to see in just a few minutes here. Um, but there will be a garden every day, if not a couple of them. And we have gone to uh, residential gardens. We've gone to school campuses uh, to really get at that facet that native plants can be everywhere in California, every corner, uh, whether it's our backyards or our built environment. So without further ado, I've kept you in suspense long enough. Um, you can hop over to Bruce's today, right off of this uh, landing page and jump into the 360 experience. So this is uh, Bruce's garden. Uh, every garden comes with about a one minute teaser uh, or introduction where the gardener gets to preface their approach and philosophy where, where the garden's located and welcome you into the garden. And then there are interpretive plant tags that will take you to our uh, Calscape profiles. And I'll just take one more minute to, to espouse the wonders of Calscape. All you have to do is type in your zip code or your address and it will bring up a list 
of plants specific to your region, which is fabulous. It'll give you a tailored hyper-local list and you can use that list to uh, go out to Theodore Payne uh, Nursery and buy the plants that uh, call your home home. Um, and it's a great resource to just familiarize yourself with your landscape and get a sense of what plants will do super well because they're so locally adapted to where you live. Um, and yeah, you get to take a spin through Bruce's yard, see all of the amazing hyperlocal plantings that he'll get to talk about in just a minute here. But again, I encourage you to click on these uh, plant tags. They'll pull up uh, a description about the plant and a link to the Calscape profile. And so you just get oh, to cool. really immerse yourself in, in the garden. So yeah. <laughs> David, too, um, I just wanted to say that Calscape is just such it's such a phenomenal resource. And not only can you search with your zip code, but you can also do advanced searches where you're like, I want a purple flowering plant that's low water that you can just set all of these different parameters um, to pull up exactly what you're looking for. Because there, there are so many <laughs> California Absolutely. native plants and that can be Absolutely. a big barrier to getting started. Um, yeah, that's that such website a is amazing. That's such a great point, Aaron. I'm so glad you brought that up. And we have just unleashed or unleashed, unveiled <laughs> a, a garden planner tool about a month ago, which just it's it's available on calscape.org. Click that link that says uh, garden planner, and that will take you to a very easy user interface where you get to do exactly that. Choose the flower colors you like, choose what um, facets of native gardening you, you might be most interested in, whether that's water conservation or habitat gardening choose the design style you like. So there's some really cool design palettes there. But overall, whether you're using that um, kind of introduction, that garden planner, or the, the full scope of Calscape, it's a really great, uh, just such a great tool to uh, use. And I will also plug the fact that you can create a plant list on there. So just like you might create like a shopping cart on an online experience, you can add specific plants to your list as you find things that interest you and excite you. So lots of capabilities on that. It's a wonderful resource. And this, uh, this Grow Care program and on these 360 tours are amazing, David. Um, we also have 360 tours on, on our webpage, website, nativeplantgardentour.org. So there's a lot of content you'll find relating to these eight tours. David has done eight of his own, which represent the whole state. So we're just focused here basically in LA, but David is going across the whole state. And it was really an honor to, to intersect on this. When we, we realized we both were working on this um, to pick a garden and, and the garden that we thought is, was the one that we should both do to, to kind of cross promote and share our audiences because we're really in this together was Bruce Schwartz's garden. It is an amazing garden. Um, and we're, that is actually where we're headed next. So thank you very much, David, for joining us today. And um, if you, I'm gonna, let's see, stop Absolutely. screen here. So such a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. And yeah, so absolutely. maybe David, you could put a few links in the chat before you go. Um, yeah, absolutely. Happy, happy California Native Plant Week. Thank you. <laughs> you <laughs> okay, so Aaron. We've got our final garden of day one. This is one of my, no, I, I will preface, I will change that. Not one of, this is my favorite garden <laughs> uh, in LA. I think it's really amazing. Um, I like them all, okay? I love all gardens, they're all good. <laughs> but this one is really great. And I, I'm excited to explore the philosophy, the plants and just the, the beauty of this whole vision and idea. So Aaron, tell us about what we're gonna see as I queue up the video here. All right, so we are headed to a beautiful garden in Highland Park. Um, it's perched on the top of a hill. Uh, it looks out across um, Eagle Rock and, um, and you're gonna see just why the location of this is, is so special and how um, Bruce Schwartz, who is here. Hey, Bruce. Hi, everybody. Welcome, we're so happy to have you. Um, and we're going to see why, how you've incorporated uh, this specific location where you're at into every aspect of the design and aesthetics of, of your garden. So here we go. Here we go. We'll start with the promo um, to kind of get us 
in the in the sense of the space, and then we will begin the discussion. And as always, please use the chat function to ask questions, share your own opinions, and here we go. start on this image. This is a pretty significant setting that we're seeing right here. Yes, it is. <clears throat> it's the context of the garden, basically. You're looking out from the garden across the Eagle Rock Valley to the San Rafael Hills, and behind that, the Verdugo Mountains. Oh, there Verdugo. we go. A little Sorry. better view. Um, and the plants that grow in those two ranges are the plants that I've chosen to plant in the garden, thinking that they're basically part of the same ecosystem. So this is a pretty specific thing and it's a little nuanced. So if you're just kind of learning about um, California native plants, California is a big place and um, a redwood tree is technically native to California, though maybe not super happy growing in <clears throat> Palm Springs, for instance. So there's it's a it's a climate a, a climate rich species rich place. There's a lot of different types of climates, a lot of microclimates, and those support different ecologies. And so what Bruce has done with his project and his his garden is base that uh, plant palette on a hyper specific and local approach based on where he is, which is here in the um, San Rafael Hills, Verdugo Mountains. And we're gonna see how beautiful and inspiring that can be. And there's a lot of significance there because this is supporting the indigenous ecology in the most deep and meaningful way possible. Um, so let's just take a few, you know, kind of bring drink in this image of, of where we are and the landscape itself has these beautiful river rocks everywhere. Bruce, can you tell us a little bit about that? Uh, well, the house was built in 1911 when river rock was all the rage. Um, when we first became the owners of this property, a lot of the walls were gone or had fallen over. So it's been a, a 30 year project to try to restore um, and add to the rock walls that were here originally when the house was built in 1911. It's beautiful. I, you've done some there's work. A, there's a big pile of rocks waiting to be made into walls still. <laughs> <laughs> I think this was shot during your uh, your your wall or your path building excursions this spring. Yes, yes. And the house itself is, is just gorgeous. Um, there you see the uh, toy on bouncing around. Rock walls along the Arroyo Seco. There is this very old LA, old California feel here. So this is this is the biggest oak on the property, which I've been told by several arborists is probably at least 200 to 250 years old. Um, I've told the story to Aaron uh, that when we came to see the house. I saw the oak trees before we went inside the house and I said, I don't care, I want the house. I don't care if it's a shack, I don't care if it's a hole in the ground because of these oak trees. Um, and they are, they are what really was the inspiration for the whole garden because they were here, you know? Um, in, in that sense, I feel extremely fortunate. Uh, the garden was never kind of a blank slate. Uh, there was a history to the garden that is embodied in these trees. And that's um, 
that was the point of departure. It's like, what, what grows under these trees? And then as I got more into it, what supports the health of these trees? You know, what, what nourishes them? And what, what, was, them? what was on in the understory of the trees when you got the property? Um, a lot of vinca, a lot of jade, birds of paradise, pittosporum, um, and mostly weeds, mostly weeds, like waist high or shoulder high weeds. Wow. Um, now you're seeing some of what's there now. There's a, this is a California polypody, uh, which is a wonderful uh, fern that appears in the spring, in the winter and spring and disappears in the summer. Um, that's bitter gooseberry. Uh, technically doesn't grow in, this, in the San Rafael Hills, but it is right outside the study area. Um, and one of the authors of that study that you based this project on was a panelist last night in our panel discussion. Naomi yes, Fraga. Naomi Fraga. It's actually called Vascular Plants of the Verdugo Mountains and San Rafael Hills. I love that. And here's the early season of hummingbird sage. There's a lot of hummingbird sage in your garden. Right. It's very happy under the oak uh, canopies. Um, yeah, when, when you first came here, there were some very early wildflowers, such as this Lupinus truncatus. And we'll see. One of the themes we've been kind of going back and forth on um, is, is just that anticipation and that build. And I think of any, any landscape, yours, first of all, it really evokes Cal, you know, the hills of Los Angeles as they likely were. We don't really know what they looked like pre-colonization, pre, pre but we can get a good, good sense. And everywhere in wild California is about anticipation and this kind of glory of spring. I mean, spring in California is incredible, especially on a good rain year. So here we're seeing, just keep, it, keep this kind of image in your mind of what we're seeing in the center here, because this is the anticipation building of annuals, annual species. For me, this actually is one of the most exciting times to see the green come back because I basically let the garden go dormant um, unless it's a new plant that needs babying through its first summer. So um, by the time you get to October, November, it's pretty brown. So um, I think equally exciting is when the first greenery starts to reappear. And it does so with very little encouragement. Um, as the days shorten and the temperatures drop and we maybe get a little rain, God willing, um, this, this is um, as uplifting to me as the, the big show in April. Yeah, absolutely. I think that is, that is so exciting. And when you learn the plants and you know you can differentiate, okay, that's not a weed, that's a clarkia, as we're seeing here, or that this is a uh, calencia. Um, yeah. Chinese houses. Yeah, it, it's, it even builds that anticipation. So kind of digging in and, and becoming a bit of a botany nerd is very rewarding when you, when you see things um, from that with the botanist side. And this is definitely a botanist garden, I think. When I tour the site, I just get so excited about the, the plants that you have. <laughs> and Bruce, you talked about all the weeds that were here when you you started and you know just getting those out has been a huge project can you talk to you a little bit about what happened once you got them out you've got some great stories about like it. i said the, the the weeds were literally shoulder high um at the end of the rainy season you had to bushwhack your way through the garden um just to get from one end of the yard to the other um and it took years of pulling the weeds out um, to get to the point where you could actually plant. And um, I found to my amazement that once the weeds were under control, that several um, local native species started to appear spontaneously, um, like uh, deer weed, uh, Acmus monglaber, just started showing up. Um, it was, was amazing to me. Um, kind of if you weed it, they will come kind of yeah. thing. Um, like that, that once you remove the, the contagion of the foreign weed seeds and create some space that the, 
the plants are just kind of that were that were native to the to the to that piece of land are just waiting for their opportunity to reemerge. Um, again, very uh, very uplifting. And I must I have to have a shout out to my gardening assistant Stevie Weinstein Foner, who without whom the weeds would have taken over already. <laughs> he, he is doing the lion's share of the weeding in the last year or two. And um, a lot of what you see is possible because weeds are forever, you know? It isn't just a question of getting rid of them and then they're gone, they come back. So thank you, Stevie. <laughs> <laughs> Sasha W is asking, what are we talking about when we say weeds? And I think everyone has their own definition. So Bruce, how do you define weed? Um, for me, a weed is a, is a plant that um, has been imported, <laughs> uh, that doesn't belong, and it's in the ecosystem in which you observe it, um, and that there are no controls for it. So it tends to um, become weedy <laughs> and crowd out the opportunities for the native plants, which aren't equipped to, to um, cope coexist with it. So, you know, when, when Europeans first arrived in this part of the world, they brought their livestock with them and in their livestock um, droppings were wheat seeds. You know, that's supposedly what destroyed the wildflower fields of California very early on. Yeah, um, well, I'm gonna pause here for a sec, but just to wrap up this weed conversation, Sasha is asking, I really most of what you see, a lot of what you see in the hills around LA are quote unquote weeds. They're European grasses that came in, as Bruce mentioned, um, with foraging animals, and they've um, taken over most of the landscape. So those green, lime green hills that we'll see in the winter time come, um, are grasses from Europe. And that's kind of typically what we mean when we say weeds. There are things that, that have weedy tendencies that are native plants, and that's a whole other conversation. But I think what we're talking about here is um, plants that are just sort of haphazard, um, kind of random plants that have arrived via some historical, kind of random historical event and have now outcompeted the native species. And I think it's important to note that. Um, you know, you can't, at this point, the, the, the toothpaste is out of the tube and you can't just throw wildflower seeds in your yard and expect them to come up tra -la, la You know, you have to, unfortunately, a wildflower meadow now in Los Angeles has to be very carefully tended and curated and guarded. Um, but that, that's kind of, we can evoke what it was like before that was necessary but we can never really return to the way it was before. Yeah, the, the project of rebuilding nature will be, uh, you know, require many hands um, because as Bruce said, the toothpaste is out of the tube, Pandora is out of the box, Humpty Dumpty is shattered. Uh, and we do have to be cognizant of that. But that doesn't mean we can't, we can't fix it. And I think this landscape is a testament to that. This is, you have a, a helper, but most of this work is done by yourself. Um, and how, how large is the property that you maintain? It's roughly a little under half an acre. Okay, so, so if you did the math there, we could actually restore a lot of, of landscape. And I think this is one parcel in a sea of, of disturbed habitat. But if you had more and more and more, I think there is actually hope way down the road. If, if everyone did this, that you could actually change ecology significantly enough that you probably could make it a lot easier and it wouldn't be such a arduous task to fight back the non-native species. Um, that would be wonderful. <laughs> I wanted to pause on this image, which we've been looking at for a minute here. This, this is uh, the namesake. Bruce is wearing the shirt today. I wore mine last night. This is the, the, uh, the icon of the 2021 garden tour, Humboldt <laughs> Valley. Um, Beautiful, beautiful plant. I wonder, Katie, if you can put some Humboldt Lily content in the chat so people can check that out. And Bruce is one of the best Humboldt Lily growers I've, I've met. 
Well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, these, these Humboldt lilies um, are planted in a quincunx, which is one of my favorite uh, configurations, the kind of the dice five. Um, and I grew them from seed that I collected in a neighbor's yard in uh, the San Gabriel's. Wow. And it took about, you can see them now in spring, how much bigger they've gotten. Um, they, it takes about three to five years to go from seed to a flowering plant. So you need a lot of patience. And there they are. Um, looking very much like Dr. Seuss drawings, I think. <laughs> yes, um, that, uh, that, that leaf style is called world, W-H-O-R-L-E-D. So they, they encircle the, the stem. And I think we're about to see some flowers. Are, are yours budding now, Bruce, or where? They're budding you? now, but they still don't have, they have still not bloomed, but the little buds are now starting to appear. Um, when you see one of these in the wild, it's astonishing. And you'll see when, um, when you see the show, photos from last year's flowers, it just doesn't look like it. It looks like it dropped in from a, a tropical rainforest, really, to the Californian landscape. Um, yeah, it, it's like a, a florist flower. It, it's just a, like a. But there, there's such an apparition from the minute they they emerge from the ground, and um, as you were saying yesterday, Evan. Um, they kind of encapsulate the, the magic of allowing, um, you know, your your environment to dictate the the schedule of blooming, and uh, and dying back in your garden. That you know these these disappear. You know they're gone. There they are. There they are. Wow. But those anthers are just massive. Those are the male pollen producing those, those that ring of structures around the, the outside of the plant um, are the pollen producing male portion of the flower and then you have the stigma in the middle and they're just right. monstrous they're huge how tall yeah. have they gotten in your yard bruce um last year with all the rain we had they were 13 to 15 feet tall this year they're about maybe 10. amazing with the drier weather we had now we're seeing that we saw the early season, early greening in winter, and now we're seeing that kind of come to life here in the wildflower meadow. You know, the yellow um, are tidy tips. So, so that central part of the yard where there aren't any oak trees growing um, directly um, provides enough sun. So I try to look for the spaces where the oak canopy isn't uh, an issue. Um, and, and make sure that I plant sun loving plants in those areas. Waiting for an airplane to pass down here where I'm zooming in from. Um, oh, this is a great plant, Bruce. What can you tell us about this? This is owl's clover. And it's, um, it's kind of hard to grow because it's a hemiparasite. It, in, it lives by um, fil uh, taking nutrients from neighboring plants. So you have to plant it with perennial grasses. Um, a, so it's kind of hard to get it going. It's a gorgeous plant, the owl's clover. And you've got a lot of, I mean, these are all, remember everybody, these are all local plants. These are things that would grow on, you know, a hike in the, in the San Gabriel Hills, a, a hike nearby in the San Rafael Hills, uh, San Gabriel Mountains, foothills. So these are things that everything here is within a few miles of Bruce's uh, house. And the diversity and beauty of these is just astonishing. There's, there's so much so close. And I don't have the complete list uh, from the Verdugo San Rafael study, but there's over a hundred different kinds of plants in the garden. Um, so it doesn't really feel that limiting. Um, I don't know, it's a container in a way. Yeah, and if you walk through this space, it, it is definitely a garden, but it also, it just has this very natural feel. I think the oaks give to that, of this sort of natural woodland. And you have little touches of kind of design in there, like this bird, 
Oxford bath here. There's a few sculptures and just things kind of placed around, but it feels uh, feels very natural. Sue's asks, is that a firecracker plant native? That is a native Penstemon centranthopolius, the scarlet bugler that we saw earlier. Now we're seeing lupins. And Bruce, you have an amazing website as well that um, you have some fantastic uh, blogs that you've written on there, as well as um, what's flowering during each month. Um, so we'll uh, make sure to drop that in the chat. Great, um, thank you. Yeah. One of my favorite flowers, the Calicortis albus, the fairy lantern. Um, also very happy under the, the oak understory. An interesting plant, the um, canyon sunflower, which looks like it should be growing in full sun, but it actually loves to grow in shade. This and one I would so, definitely recommend. Um, the Venegasia is the scientific name, but that is a wonderful local native plant. And how do you manage your wildflowers? Do you what do you do with them throughout the year? What do I what? Uh, with your wildflowers, how do you kind of manage their cycle throughout the year? Well, I, I don't actually plant seeds anymore because they just broadcast their own seeds, but. Um, so I wait until the rains come. Oh, if the rains don't come, I start watering in November and um, kind of nurture them along if there isn't enough rain. Um, and then when they, they uh, deposit their seed and die, I just kind of let, leave them there and crumble them up and wait for next year. And it's funny little miner's lettuce <laughs> growing everywhere. <laughs> it's amazing. It's growing out of the, that's the olive tree, I think. Yes, yes. Which was grandfathered that's... into this landscape. Right. Very old olive tree. <laughs> it's, it's harboring a native plant, so it, it gets a pass. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, you know, so you were, you were asking Evan about you know, how I wild, manage the wildflowers, but in general, you know, a lot of the reason the birds show up is not because they think the plants are pretty, but because they are attracted to their seed. So, um, you know, leaving as much of the seed on the ground as possible is, you know, a way to, to attract birds to your garden. Yes, and this is, this is a beautiful plant. What are we looking at here, Bruce? Um, Chinese houses. Colin Sierra Fula um, likes shade, which is, you know, again, when you have a, a property as blessed as this one is with big trees, well, you have a lot of shade. This is another shade loving annual baby blue eyes. Um, it's nice to have those spots of color. There's a question, Bruce, about how you irrigate this garden. It's all hand watered. Um, I try not to, and try not to water after the first or second summer. Um, if the plant doesn't make it, then try something else. Um, but it's, it's, it's a labor of love to water the garden. It is. Um, but I enjoy it. It gives me an opportunity to be out there. And I also, you know, I think it conserves water because I really, I look carefully at what needs watering and that's what I water and nothing else gets watered. That's one of those plants that appeared after I started weeding, Facilia distance, common Facilia, it just showed up and now it's everywhere. In fact, I have to curate it because it's it takes over. Wow. That's new growth on the Opuntia pads there in, uh, in Artemisia. Oh, and okay, so if anyone joined us for our beer tasting last night, you got to drink this plant in liquid form, in beer in beer form. This is the Bully Blue Curls. Um, what does Bully Blue Curls smell like to you, Bruce? Bubblegum. Bubblegum. 
or at least from my childhood bubble gum, like bazooka bubble gum. That's what it smells like to me. Yeah, like a- This one isn't quite blooming. It's just about to, right there. Um, I'd love the chat to, to tell us what does woolly blue curl smell like to you? <laughs> to me, I say it smells like blue Gatorade. <laughs> Wonderful native bulb here. That's uh, golden stars. So this is my um, my propagation area, and I, I started propagating my own plants because I wanted them to be local. Um, also, um, I needed more than than was practical, so I started propagating my own plants, and. Um, as you know, when you propagate plants, you can't grow three plants. If you need three plants, you need to plant 30 because the rate of attrition is, uh, is pretty high. So um, now I make the extra plants that I don't need uh, available for sale. There's I'm growing poison oak there um, <laughs> successfully uh, after many <laughs> years of trying. Let's pause uh, on that for a second because you, you said that very nonchalantly. <laughs> I'm growing poison oak here. Yeah. Um, why are you growing poison oak? <laughs> um, it's 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 a plant that belongs here. You know, for, from an anthropocentric viewpoint, it's not a good plant. But um, if you're a spotted tohi, uh, it's a very desirable plant because the berries are very tasty. Um, I I also feel that the um, I'm a big fan of the concept of the wood wide web of the network of soil fungi that the plants use to communicate with one another and and support each other and poison oak um, has been largely extirpated from our urban gardens for obvious reasons um, even though it does grow wild here on on this property um, which is why i decided to to bring it back so actually plant it under the oak because my my belief is that it's an important member of this, this um, dialogue that's going on underneath the ground. And that um, my, my theory, it's not mine alone, but my theory is that um, reestablishing this network of communication as it was before it was rendered um, broken, which when it was uh, sundered, uh, will help the trees. And, you know, again, going back to where we started, um, it, for me, it's, you know, that it all goes back to the oak trees because I feel like I'm their guardian. I'm their steward for this short period of time that I'm on this earth. Um, and so the poison oak is really about the oak trees for me. And I'm very allergic to it. I practically <laughs> just look at it and I get a rash. So it's not like I have a, an easy relationship with this plant, but um, I really feel like it's it, it's bringing it back into the family of native plants, and you know, obviously in a controlled way, um, is important. Yeah. So I'm growing it. Good, good for you. So, you are so line up. I love it. <laughs> Take you know, I'm taking orders. Operators are standing <laughs> by. <laughs> yeah, you can buy your. Uh... Fire, Toxicodendron, Diversilogum, Poison Oak. I, I have to say, I was out in Millard Canyon where I know you spent a lot of time, Bruce, and earlier this spring, seeing it leafing out and the sheen of its leaf is absolutely gorgeous. And for fall color, it's one of the nicest shrubs, I think. It has beautiful red fall foliage, one of the nicest native shrubs. It is beautiful, it really is. And I did, again, it, it does give you a sense of season in a sense of place, which again, you know, the phenomenon of Los Angeles is kind of about the erasure of those things, you know? And so this is kind of a radical way of, of um, responding to that erasure that's taking place in this part of the world. I love that. Sacrificing your skin for the future of Los Angeles. <laughs> And there's a baby Humboldt lily. Um, looks like from the tag that it's already three years old. Um, um, they take a long time. 
take a long time. And if you buy one from Theodore Payne and you wonder why they're so expensive, it's because they're <laughs> very old and they have a lot of man hours invested in them for water. That's true. That's true. Three years old. <laughs> Do we still have some? Yes, we should. And now we're going to end on this final shot, um, looking out into the hills that inspired this remarkable garden. Thank you so much for including my garden on the tour. It's such an honor. I really appreciate it. Evan and Aaron and Marie and everybody who contributed to this. It's just really, a, it's like I said, it's an honor. Thank you. It's an honor to, to share your garden, Bruce. As I said, it's one of my favorites. Um, it's, it's really, really amazing. It's, it has a deep philosophy. It's also just really beautiful. And, Hopefully when there's an in-person tour, we can feature it so that everyone who's watching these beautiful images can see it. In the meantime, um, you have some resources. If you could just type those in the chat, I think Katie has shared them, but LA, uh, LA Native Plant Source, and they have an Instagram account, they have a website, a blog. Katie's sharing it again. Thank you very much, Bruce, for being here, and I will see you Thank soon. you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for watching. Thank you. There's Marie, everybody. I, hopefully you can see her. Marie, Marie, do you want to just say a few words? Yes, hold on. Can you guys hear me this time? Yes. Yay. Okay. Thank you so much, Bruce. It was such a great honor to work with you on your garden. It's just truly beautiful and very inspiring. Thank you. Thank you. All right, everybody. That's, that's all of our gardens today, but we have one more very important thing, which Marie is, and Katie are going to... Uh, take over now and share our photo contest. We had a photo contest Yay. going. So Yay. <laughs> yeah, so first of all, uh, we just wanted to say thank you to all of you who sent in your pictures. Uh, we received hundreds of entries through our email and through our social media channels. And it was just great to see that very special relationship that everybody has with, with their garden. Um, we had three categories. We had pots and plants, habitat, and spring vibes. And the winner of each category is going to receive a $100 TPF gift card, um, which can be used at our TPF um, store in Sun Valley. And we're just hoping that everyone's been truly inspired by all the gardens and the panel spe you know, speakers throughout the weekend so they can try something new in their gardens. So we're just like really hoping that that will be the case. And with that, I'll just leave it um, over to Kate so she can announce and show the, the big winners. Hi guys. So I'm just gonna be sharing my screen here. Um, but thanks to all of you guys who submitted. And actually, if you want to see any of the entries, you can go to uh, nativeplantgardentour.org. And at the bottom of the page, that we have our, our social entries. So, so all of the ones that were um, sent in by social, you can see some of the examples there. All right. And sorry, it's taking a second. I'm getting them up right now. All right. Can everyone see this beautiful picture? Yes. Um, so this was submitted by Duncan Sinclair. Say hi if you're in the chat. If not, we will be reaching out. Um, and so this is the one that we chose for the spring vibes category. Uh, if you can tell, this is a picture of a bunch of wildflowers. Well, there's at least one perennial in there. Um, but looking left to right, we have some lupin plants and the purple. We have some perhaps Clarkia unguiculata um, with the pink and then Sorelsia ambigua and the orange looks like a Penstemon centranthifolius in the hot pink in the top right. And then Colinsia heterophylla in the bottom right with the purple and white. Um, and wildflowers, we had one person in the chat that said they hadn't seen wildflowers before this year. So if anyone isn't familiar these are annual plants and it's a really special thing about our Mediterranean climate because these plants are experts at coming back from the dead. So every year the parent plant will drop a bunch of seeds and then it dies. And so if we get enough rain, they'll come back. If we don't have much rain like this year, we don't get as much of a flower show. 
But if you want to create that in your yard, you can just sow your seeds in fall and winter. And if we don't get a lot of rain, you just water them in yourself. So you can totally make this happen if you want. Okay, so thanks, Duncan Sinclair. Gonna bring up the next one now. Oh yeah, so this one, can everyone see it? Can you see that okay? Yes. So this one um, was for our plants in pots category. And you can see, well, in the foreground, there's California poppy, which everybody knows and loves. Um, and those can, those can be in containers. You just want to sow the seeds directly in a container and don't try to transplant it. Um, and then behind that, you see a Dudleya pachyphytum um, with those nice juicy succulent leaves. And then behind that, I think is a, there's another Dudleya, maybe Lanceolata, a big one in the back and a Dudleya um, cespitosa on the right. Or maybe that's a Bretonia. I don't, someone help me out if you know what the one in the back is. But um, they're great container plants. Those succulent leaves make them really good for just watering deeply and then letting them sit dry for a while. Um, and we're going to be having a container class on Wednesday, April 21st with Flora Edo. If you are interested in participating in that, if you don't have a yard, if you just have a balcony or like a front porch or anywhere you can put a container, you can still create wildlife habitat. So definitely check out that class, but also great photo from ReadyMod on IG. We'll be reaching out to you. Sorry, I don't have your full name, but great photo. And then last but not least, we're gonna be going over to this beautiful photo. Um, this is by Locke Tran. And these are some cedar wax wings, uh, North American birds. They migrate and they winter down in SoCal, I believe. And these ones are just munching on some toyon berries. Amazing. So this is a great reminder to us that your yard is their pantry. And if you don't have any food in the pantry, they're not gonna wanna come hang out there. So um, <laughs> if you wanna see lots of birds and lots of wildlife, give them some food, you know, um, have plants that have berries and seeds they like to forage. And then also if you plant things that insects like to eat, then the birds will also come and eat those insects. So Lakhtran, you also have won a $100 gift card to Theodore Payne. All three winners each get a $100 gift card. And I'm just gonna also use this picture to plug our keynote um, presentation tomorrow with Douglas Tallamy. It's going to be a really good conversation. Um, he has so much research and so many sources backing up exactly how native plants benefit um, the ecosystem and how it's such a great thing we can do to kind of counteract the habitat that we have greatly, greatly reduced with our own urban footprint. So thanks and congrats to the winners. We'll be Thank reaching you. out to you guys to give you your $100 gift card. And thanks. Very cool. Well, congratulations to the winners. And thank you, Katie. This was wonderful. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Marie and Katie. They have both been um, essential and done so much work to get this together. Marie texted me at 5.30 last night, still editing the final videos for tomorrow. We are done. We're ready. We have four fantastic gardens coming up tomorrow we hope you guys enjoyed the first day of gardens we hope you had fun last night and we had our wonderful kickoff party it's all going to be available to watch again in the future so on tuesday you'll be getting youtube links with everything um, and you can go back to check out anything you might have missed i'm really excited about tomorrow aaron any final words before we uh depart for the day no thank you all so much for tuning in uh, to Zoom on a beautiful spring day today. And we hope you all go out, go to LA State Historic Park, go out, see the flowers, and we're excited to see you tomorrow. We'll see you tomorrow. See you tomorrow, everybody, 10 a.m. Everybody, bye.